Welcome, and today we're going to be talking about some new topics that's never been brought up on the channel. We're starting a new series called Cryptids Unveiled. There's really so much ground to cover, and I think it'll be interesting to view these topics from an occult mindset. This series will start off with an introduction, and then move on to more specific cases where we can learn more about each cryptid on its own and viewing their history. You most likely have heard of cryptozoology, but if you look it up on Wikipedia, they don't take it seriously at all. They actually have a quote that just says how humans are the most gullible of all creatures, when there is in fact truth to this subject, especially when you consider some of the animals that were thought to be extinct by the scientific establishment, but later found out to be still alive in very small, rare amounts. Then you have the propaganda, and to me this is what really ruined the field is that from the 80s to the early 2000s, you have all these shows that try to ride this trend, but in the end of every episode you would realize that they never really found anything. Some of the earlier ones were really good, but as you get to the newer content, it's obvious that this has been corrupted and just used to make money off of people who believe in this stuff. And now, today, there are barely any shows on the subject. But now, it's become a joke. And many of you who are new to this subject might think, what does this have to do with alternative history or the occult? Everything, because if you can open your mind to the possibility that these stories may be true, it changes our entire perception of reality. The best proof for cryptids, in my opinion, are stories from the individuals who experienced it themselves. There is a small niche genre on YouTube where people organize interviews and usually have people who call in who don't know too much about technology, as many of these stories, these individuals live in very rural areas. I want to encourage you guys to go listen to these stories if you've never heard them. We picked out a few of our favorite channels and videos, so if you're new, you can get started down this journey right now. Check out the description. It's important to mention that not all these storytellers are being honest and it's usually noticeable because it doesn't really attract you in the right way. Like, you know a good story when you hear one, it has a specific ring to it. And usually you can feel that there's something different about someone who's truly being genuine with their account. Now, here's a little brief intro to the best cryptid stories. You have Sasquatch or other human stories. Then you have Dogman, which is very popular, but basically some type of hybrid dog or werewolf being. Then you have Thunderbirds and or hybrid human slash flying beings. Then you have Dark Magicians and Little People. These seem to be kind of our favorite cryptids to explore. And again, I think once you go down this rabbit hole, it really makes you question the world we live in. Okay, so before we begin, if you guys could like, subscribe, and tell a friend about us, it would really mean a lot. YT and other agencies are most likely not fond of our channel, so we need to start spreading via word of mouth. Anything helps really, even just a comment. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Our most favorite channel on this subject was definitely Brenton Sawin Mysteries to Search. I'd like to take a moment to thank the late Brenton Sawin for so many intriguing and amazing videos he posted over the years. He had a very unique take on this subject and was a very likable YouTube personality. Unfortunately, at this moment in time, his channel has fallen into the hands of someone who doesn't care to maintain the legacy he spent his life creating. It's really a shame, and all we can really do is relay this specific story to the best of our ability. I'm sure other folks who saw the video we are referring to can add a little more clarity, because this one was a doozy. This is probably our favorite story from this channel, but there were so many good ones. This particular encounter was like a metaphysical experience in some ways, but the multiple witnesses seemed to suggest that it was something that was actually present in our realm. The caller was a middle-aged lady from a ranch in Texas, and we will try our best to recount this because this video is no longer public. But she starts out basically saying where she lives, which is a very rural area in Texas, and she's on her way home. So she's on her cell phone with her aunt. Until she got to the last couple miles, she told her aunt she was home so she could roll down her windows and play some music and relax for the final stretch. When she was going along the dark country road, she saw a strange silhouette on the water tower. Now this water tower is something that she has to pass every time she comes home, but tonight there was something weird going on. It looked to her like a bunch of people dancing in robes with a much larger man in the middle. She turned the music down and with the window still open, she could hear a distant chanting-like sound. The sound entranced her for what felt like a brief moment before she noticed that she had slowed to a stop. She tried to focus her eyes and get a closer look, but the large robed figure on top of the water tower turned its head and looked straight at her. 
In that very instant, the figure appeared in front of her window only a few feet away from her. It resembled a man wearing what she thought was a cloak, but upon second glance, she could see that he was covered in inky black feathers. She described the face as being pale gray or white. Its lips were thin and red. Its nose was hooked like a beak, and she thought it was probably a man since the creature was bald. They locked eyes for a moment. His were like shiny black beads, and her eyes shot down to see that he had bony white hands coming out of the mass of feathers. She looked back at his eyes, and she got the mental message that said something along the lines of, Yes, I have hands. She didn't get to see the feet, as he was too close to her vehicle. She broke out of her stupor and slammed her foot on the gas. She frantically called her husband to open the gate for her because there was some kind of weird thing out there. When she finally arrived, her husband, frustrated and concerned, asked her what took her so long. He thought she was right down the road. She asked what he meant, and he informed her that it had been over an hour since their phone call. She looked at her cell phone and was shocked to see that it had been an hour, despite her only being a few minutes down the road. This obviously freaks her out, and she grabs her shotgun and calls the local sheriff. She explains to him that some people were on top of the water tower doing some kind of weird ritual, and that he should send someone to go check it out. He does, and about an hour later an officer arrives at her home and says that there was just some crows. During that following week, she asked around the area to see if anyone had also seen anything strange. She, she spoke to a local man who shockingly relayed to her an experience nearly identical to her own. The man said that his brother, who often visited him from Dallas, had also seen the dancing figures and come face to face with the strange bird-like man. He said that his brother had arrived at his house late in the evening and was completely frantic. He said that his brother described nearly the same scene, but instead of looking down at his hands, the brother leaned out of his window to check out the creature's feet. The man was shocked to see that this creature was wearing red tennis shoes, the same exact kind of shoes that he always wore. He looked into its eyes again and got the feeling that he was being mocked by this thing. The guy said that his brother didn't even stay at his house and drove all the way back to Dallas that night and hasn't visited since. Later that week, she was talking to her husband about it while they were out in the yard together with their little dog. She said that she saw a crow walking around her property and it looked as if it was trying to show them something. So they followed the crow into the woods a little bit before an alarm went off in her head that her dog is all alone in the front yard. She runs back and sees some crows attacking her dog, so they intervene and the crows fly away. She realizes that these crows are pretty smart, maybe too smart. There was some talk of her getting strange phone calls and even a break in the recording while her and Brenton were having the interview. She determined that it was some sort of demon, since it seemed to have power over the local birds and showed itself to multiple people. One of her neighbors, a black lady whose family had lived in town for many generations, listened to her story and told her that the area that she saw the bird creature had a long history of black magic and dark rituals. This news was shocking, but she wasn't surprised based on what she'd witnessed. There really is a lot of good ones from this channel, and I wish they still had them up because there is another channel that's uploaded a few of these to YT, but I only wanted to present the best stories in this video to keep you interested because if you're new to this, it takes a lot of time to get to the really good ones, and one story that's mediocre can kind of ruin this topic for beginners. Okay, so this next story is from the channel called Dogman Encounters. And just to keep in mind that just because we bring up these channels, doesn't mean that we believe in every account on the channel. We're simply bringing up our favorite stories. Please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm uh, 30 years old. I've got uh, my wife and my daughter. Just go to work, come back home, do the family thing. And I do enjoy very much going into the woods and being able to enjoy the outdoors, being able to have respect for the animal as well as, you know, any type of fishing and hunting I really enjoy. I like to be able to create memories with my family that way. And I think that it's a good experience for all of us to be able to get outdoors and, and be able to actually smell the trees and smell the fresh air and see the other animals and see what they're doing and be able to create a bond and a relationship with nature all together. And I definitely have had quite a change with that recently, but my schedule on a weekly basis is usually pretty much the same. I get up, I help make breakfast, I kiss my family goodbye, and 
go to work and come home and try to unwind at that point in my free time basically is just made up of being in the outdoors and being able to enjoy it. After seeing what I had seen, I was unsure as to where it is that I need to go, being that it's not exactly something you hear every day. And at first I said, well, I think I'm going to explain this to a couple of close friends. And regardless of what people's perspective of me are, I've spent a lot of time trying to be able to have everyone understand that I'm honest and I'm straightforward with things. So to tell people how much of an emotionally distraught encounter this was and not have the respect or belief from everyone to get in return, I... I thought that it would be best for me to, other than being ridiculed and mocked by people that I've built these relationships with over the past 31 years, I went and I've got professional help. Now, over the past month, I've done so. And even from them, their professional perspective is to basically sit and listen. And still knowing in the back of my head that I know that this counselor, this therapist, doesn't believe a word that I'm saying. I think she believes that I believe that it happened, and it didn't really do anything for me. I was not able to express myself. I I had expressed myself, but I had not, I hadn't received the input back that I was expecting that I would get help for. I guess what I'm trying to say is, no, I I didn't get any help from spending money on someone to listen to my problems. And uh, I would have hoped to have got something a little bit different in return from them, being that I paid money for it. It didn't make me feel any better. I felt now, other than being mocked from close friends, now I have a complete stranger who doesn't believe anything that I'm saying. and. I stopped going just recently after we had spoke the other day. And the difference in that was I could see that you have a real understanding for these encounters. And to know that someone else believes me, to know that someone else understands what it was that I had went through physically and mentally as well as emotionally, Because being as emotionally involved in the encounter as I was, and I'm sure a lot of other people were, it's very difficult to think clearly when you're emotionally involved in a situation, not let alone be able to express and relive that encounter again. So to be able to do that with somebody who you know isn't listening and isn't on the same page is almost a waste of time, and I know a waste of money from personal experience. But after speaking to you the other day, I was able to really get a good grasp for the right way to talk about it. And you had shown a lot of support. And being that I know that you do believe me is such a huge difference because when you know that you have a group of individuals or an individual by themselves that is interested in hearing what you're saying and There's no controversy in truth. They know that this is real, and that means a lot more personally to me. Before you tell us about your encounter, please tell us about the place where it happened. Well, I live in Cato, New York. It's uh, upstate New York. Very country-type setting. The house is on a road that's about seven miles, eight miles long, connects two other back roads. It was kind of stone road up until about 15 years ago, and they just started recently paving it. There's only about five houses on that street, and it would take about 25 minutes to be able to walk to your neighbor, 30 minutes. It's all surrounded by woods and fields. I have 192 acres out there. 50 of them are woods, and the rest of them are 
cornfields and other uh, farmland that I've rented out to the farmers that live in the area in exchange for a quarter cow or a half a pig and money on an annual basis, as well as uh, I can still hunt that land. The house is about 40 feet away from the road, and uh, all around me on the right and left and back side is all pretty thick woods. And uh, across the street is all very thick woods and, and fields. It's very quiet at night, and it would take a long time to be able to get to somebody if someone really needed some help. Pretty much out there alone. Oh, it sounds like a really nice property. It's just a shame that you're not able to enjoy it the way you once were able to, now that you know you might have a dog man roaming around there still. All right, Brandon, please tell us about your encounter. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Well, this was the beginning of February, a few weeks ago. It was February 2nd, 2018. And uh, that was definitely the day that had changed my life. I had got up in the morning and kissed my family goodbye and went to work like I normally do around 5 a.m. I uh, had gotten a few phone calls throughout the day from my wife and she stays home with our newborn, and I had gotten a few calls from her, and she had said, because we have some cows, some livestock, about 12 of them, and she had called me, and she'd been concerned. And she had said, hey, uh, do you know that all of the cows are huddled up in the corner closest to the house, away from the wood line, and they've been there all day? They won't eat, they won't move, or anything. And I didn't pay any mind to it. I was really busy at work. And I said, you know, don't worry about it. I'll check it out later. I'm, I'm busy right now. And I just kind of figured, all right, well, maybe, you know, coyotes are out there messing with them again. I'll handle them later on. They are quite a nuisance around where we are. So I just had assumed at the time that that's what it was because that's what I'm familiar with. So I didn't pay any mind to that. And uh, I get another phone call right before I had left work. And uh, it was my wife calling me back, and she had said, I'm not able to let the dog out. Maya won't go outside. I'm having to drag her outside by her collar to go pee. She doesn't want to go out, and uh, I'm not sure what's going on with her. And I said, okay. I said, I'm almost home. You know, I'll deal with it when I get home. Now, I'm thinking that this is pretty strange now because the animals know most of the time a lot more than, you know, we know. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why not the cows all bundled up in the corner there? Now the dog won't go outside. You know, what's going on here? So now I'm a little bit concerned, but it's not a big deal at the moment. So I'm pulling up here, and on the left side, the cornfield's there across the street. And I just get past the hedgerow where it starts to open up on the right where my lawn is. And we've got about six acres of mowed grass around our house, and the rest is fields. and woods and I see the cows and they're scrunched up in like a 20 by 20 foot area in the closest corner of their fenced in plot and I'm thinking to myself what is this and I've never seen them do this before I mean they were almost on top of each other Vic they were climbing up and trying to get closer and closer huddled up into the corner and they had popped the breaker because they kept pushing into the fence, which is an electric fence, and they each had touched it so many times, I'm not sure what had happened, but they didn't care about it. They had actually popped the breaker so there was no electricity running through the fence anymore. It may have popped a line or a wire somewhere, I'm not sure. But I could see that they were scared of something. Something was going on, and at that point I'm thinking, wow, there must be a big pack out here, I'm going to have to deal with this. So I'm looking at them scrunching them in 12 full-grown cows here in about a 20 by 20 foot circle. And I'm like, okay, definitely coyotes. So I parked and I get out, I get my work stuff and I go to walk inside. I'm walking up the front driveway and it's dusk now. And I'm walking up and I'll tell you, I hear the most deep, but raspy, gurgly, almost scream howl. And it literally sent chills down my spine. The hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I thought, what the f*** was that? And I've been in the woods since I was a kid. I've hunted and fished since I was a kid. And I've never heard anything like this. But again, going by what I know, I thought, okay, 
some type of coyote was attacked or some type of animal out there, something's going on. Now, although the DEC says there's no mountain lions in our area, I know that there is. So I'm thinking, well, even though I haven't seen a mountain lion, I know that there has been some sightings around the area very rarely. But I figured, well, maybe that's it. But something still is different because I'd even heard them on YouTube, and I know that that wasn't it. So I get inside, and my wife's jabbering a mile a minute about everything she dealt with today. And uh, outside the phone calls that she had told me when I had left in the early morning, she said that she had heard scratching at the window, a real deep scratching noise on the side of the house, not like a branch type of scratch. And I said, what do you mean? I, I don't understand. And she said, come look at this. So she walks me outside, and I see deep scratches in the siding. There's four lines. The one on the left is the lightest, and then the one to the right of that was pretty deep. The one next to that was very deep, and the one all the way to the right was fairly deep as well. And I'm looking at this thing, and I'm like, what the hell is this? And I'm thinking to myself, what could have done that? And I'm looking around. There's no branches that would have done anything like that. And I said, did you bang into the house with anything? Did you move something up onto the deck? Because I have built a big deck that wraps around most of the house. And I said, did you move some of the chairs or, or lawn stuff? And she said, no. She said, I heard this, and I had come out a little while after to see it. So I said, okay, I, I don't know what this is. And as we're discussing this, and I'm seeing that it's really bad, we hear as we're walking back in, this howl again, this deep, gurgly type of scream, and it just shook me to my core. And I saw my wife's eyes get huge. We exchanged glances, and I said, did you hear that? And she said, yeah. And I said, what the hell is that? She said to me, I I'm not sure. And she goes, you would know better than I would. And I said, I have absolutely no clue, honey. I've never heard that noise before. And we can see all the cattle in the corner. Now they're climbing up on top of each other as that noise is being projected towards us. They hear it as well. Now all these cows are jumping on top of each other. They're pushing and pushing and pushing in the corner. They're trying to get out of this fenced-in area. And I'm thinking, oh, God, now I'm going to have to fix this fence. They're going to bust it out. So I'm thinking maybe I should move them until I find out what exactly it is that's going on here. So we walk back into the house, and we're talking about this. and. We get back in, and I'm sitting to try to think what I can do about this cattle because I'm thinking, I don't want to lose all my cattle. So I load my shotgun up, and I call my neighbor, and I say, hey, Gene, I said, come on down. I said, let's go for a ride out back in the buggy. It's like a four-wheeler razor type thing. And I said, we'll come down, and we'll see what we can do to take care of some of these coyote because they're a big problem out here. So he comes down. I explained to him a little bit about the situation. I say, you know, have you heard this noise at all around here? And he says, no. And I, and I sounded like a fool trying to explain to him that it sounded like a woman that had been smoking 30 cigarettes an hour for the last 65 years. But it was deep and it was raspy and like a woman screaming. It's, it's difficult to explain. And, you know, he kind of looks at me like, okay, you know, whatever. So we load up, and I tell my wife, I said, we're going out back, and we're going to get rid of some of these coyote. And she said, okay. So we go out, and what, what I normally do is, with the coyote out here, I have a wireless call, which is a speaker box with a wireless remote. And you can hit different calls, which some are, for an example here, a dying rabbit or a squirrel or whatever it may be that brings them in. They hear that, and it brings them in. And I have a spotlight that I put a red lens cover over because they can't see the color red. So we load all that stuff up, we throw it in the back, and I'm explaining to them, I said, on the way out, these cows are doing this, they're doing that, and I'm not sure what to do. So we get going down the road, and it's about a, I don't know, probably not even a two-minute ride down, and it's dark out now. We get down a little ways, and the dirt road's on the left, and we go to turn down my dirt road here, and we get turned down the dirt road, and I'm looking at multiple groups of deer literally breaking out of the woods and running towards us. I mean, they're headed across the street. They're coming straight at us. This dirt road is about five to six foot wide, and then on each side of the road, there's about two foot of 
brush. And then right on the other side of that is the woods on both sides. So I'm looking, and they're not in the woods. They're right on the edges of the dirt road. And these deer are flying towards us, white flags flying, tails in the air. Something's going on. And they're going by us, maybe 10 feet on each each side of us here. They're not worried about us coming down in the buggy or anything. And I'm thinking to myself, do you, are you looking at this right now? Can you see this, Gene? And it's just his mouth kind of hanging open like that's just a strange thing to see, them coming right at us. And there was about three or four groups of two to four deer about 25, 30 feet apart, and they're all just coming flying at us. And I'm thinking, wow, there must be a big pack out here. We're really going to have to do some work. So we get going down the dirt road. The deer pass us. And I knew something was wrong. So I said, you know, if you see anything before we get down there on the way, I said, shoot what you see. And we get going about a half mile down the road, and I'm doing about 45 now down this dirt trail. And as we're getting in, we're about two miles or so into the woods now. And it's all woods around me. It's dark out. And I hear something smashing like it's some type of rhino in the woods next to us. And I'm just buzzing along, and I'm thinking to myself, we've got no bears or moose in this area. And I said, what the hell is that? So I start to slow down, and I stop, and the buggy is just idling. And I get the worst feeling of my life, like somebody is watching me. Something is watching me right now. And I'm getting goosebumps everywhere. The hair stands up on the back of my neck. And Gene's voice is real shaky. And he says to me, we need to leave right now. Something's not right, and it is dead quiet. There's no sound, no animals, no nothing. And I kind of trying to keep my cool, even though I feel it too. And it's intense, Vic. It's intense. And I said, don't get all scary on me here. We got firearms. Just relax. You know, thinking to myself, there's nothing in the woods here that I haven't seen in the past 30 years. No way. So we sit for another maybe 20 seconds, and I shut the buggy off now. So there's no more idle. And I hear this heavy, heavy breathing. The trail is about road size, like I said. Wood line on about six to eight feet of each side of us. And we're sitting about two miles in the woods now. Complete darkness. Just the lights on in front of the buggy. And I said, dude, do you hear that? And I reached over with my spotlight. And I pull it up. I pull the red lens cover off. And as I go over to shine this, and I said, point your gun over here. And he's got it up. Now, what I'm about to tell you here is is where everybody has put me down and I feel has ruined my reputation for being honest and true in every sense. But that doesn't embarrass me because we know what we saw. Now... I pulled that spotlight out thick, and I scanned the first few feet heading into the woods. And I got to the general area where I heard that breathing. Now, this is a million candlelight spotlight, and uh, it's it's very bright. It's got like an 8 or 10-inch head on it, and it's got the trigger on it. You hold up, and I get to the general general area where I had heard that heavy breathing, and I look in, and... I see some type of hairy animal, and I could see that it's got its arm around a tree a little bit. And I'm thinking to myself, whoa, what the hell is that? And its head on the back looked like I could see ears, pointy ears, that looked like some type of daggers about 8 inches, maybe 10 inches on the top of its head. And as I am shining the light, I, I hit the top and I, I see like this, whatever this thing is, it turns and steps away a little bit from the tree. And I can't believe what I'm seeing. This thing had a snout like the most stereotypical werewolf. That's all I thought. This is a werewolf. But my brain isn't working properly because I'm thinking to myself, this isn't real. 
there's no way that I'm I'm seeing this creature here. This looks like if you've ever seen the movie Van Helsing, it looks like that exact werewolf, almost 98% similar. Okay, and now I can hear my heartbeat in my ears. It is all quiet around us, other than this breathing from this creature I'm looking at, and I'm just completely shook to my core. I've never seen anything like this in my life. This isn't supposed to be real. This isn't a real creature. There's no way that I'm looking at this. I'm staring at this thing, not knowing how much time has gone by. And it turns a little more, and I see its eyes. Now, its eyes were like a bright. If you held a corona up to the sunlight, that's what this thing's eyes looked like, like a goldish amber color. And it turns, and I see its, its snout. It looks like a dog snout, but it's got a massive head. And I'm talking, I can see its its arm a little bit, but just its its hand. And I'm I'm trying to rack through my brain, and I'm seeing all of these things kind of at once, and, and they're not making any sense to me. It's got a huge head. The hair on it is is like this short kind of. It's not shaggy. I could almost see its skin uh, underneath. But I, I'm noticing that this thing's got bright gold eyes, pointy dog ears, and a, and a, a snout like a, like some type of canine creature. That's when I am trying to process all this and it seemed like 20 minutes. I don't know exactly how long it was, but all of a sudden Gene screamed real loud and that scared me even more. And at that point, that broke the silence, and this thing stepped away from the tree it was up against, and I couldn't believe what I saw. This thing, it was making some type of cracking noise. Like if you had 15, 20 people together cracking their knuckles in a microphone on a loudspeaker, and bones were breaking inside of somebody's body, this thing stands up on two legs, Vic. Its back legs, it has haunches like a dog, okay? This thing is almost eight foot, nine foot tall. This thing is so big, at 15, maybe 18 feet away, I could see this thing clear as day. There is no question. My spotlight is on this thing, and it's fully charged, brighter than ever. I just, I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. It's chest looked like some type of world record bodybuilder this thing was jacked its arms from the shoulder to the elbow looked like a normal length but the length from the elbow to the wrist were extra long almost twice as long as the top part it had hands vic this thing had five fingers with nails on them, sharp nails that looked like black knives on the tip of its fingers, a couple inches long. It just had these big hands, and I, it's not processing with me. I didn't understand what it is that I'm looking at here. I can see it's jacked. It's massive chest, huge arms, I mean ripped. It's got abs like some 30-year-old at a gym. Its waist seemed to be fitting, I guess you could say. It was smaller, and its legs were pretty jacked, but they were skinny, and it had its legs bent backwards like a dog, but I'm so confused. I'm looking at the werewolf thing, and it's standing up on two legs. There's no way. There's absolutely no way in the cracking sound that I'm hearing when this thing stood all the way up. I, I didn't understand what's making that noise, and I know it wasn't branches breaking because I heard the branches breaking on the way down. And as this thing is breathing heavily, which I'm assuming it's breathing heavily because of it keeping up with us in the woods at 40 miles an hour, going down next to us, just smashing through things. And I'm not talking twigs and, and sticks here. That These are big branches this thing is just barreling through. So he screams, I'm taking the inventory of what it is that I'm looking at here, and I am just completely blown away. The most 
fearful I have ever been in my entire life. It just, I, I thought I'm in a nightmare. I tried to close my eyes and shake my head and wake up, and, and it was still there. It was real. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what's my next move? There's no way that this is happening. I can't understand or fathom or process what this creature is that I'm looking at. So Gene screams, I'm looking at this thing. And at that point, I, I didn't even know what to do. I was stuck. So it stands up and I see its arms hanging down in front of it. And it, I just didn't know what to do at that point. And the only thing that broke the silence at that point was that scream and Gene fires three shots in a row at this thing. Now this is a Remington 875 shot pump. Okay. High brass slugs. He's shooting out of this thing at 15 to 18 feet away. He fires the first one. And at this point, my ears are ringing because he's right next to me. We're in somewhat of an enclosed vehicle, but I got the spotlight on this creature still. And I see this first bullet hit its chest. It rips the whole right side pectoral muscle almost off of this thing. I can see it rip the skin. I can see the blood. This thing is real. It It is a creature. It does bleed. I can see that the whole right pectoral muscle was completely almost torn off of its body. Pieces were hanging down. And this thing lets out a scream. And at that point, he had fired two more shots right away afterwards. But this thing was fast, Vic. This thing was real fast. So the three shots in a row, after the first bullet hits his chest and rips the skin and the pectoral muscle, this thing jumped, okay? No exaggeration. This thing jumped clear 15 feet up into the tree, okay, and almost 30 feet across the dirt road into the other side of the woods. As it goes across, okay, I can see... From what little moonlight that we have. Now, the buggy lights are on in the front, but I couldn't, I didn't move my spotlight with the creature because he did it so fast. But as it gets and jumps across the the way here, right in front of us, I can get a good look at this thing all the way compared to other things around it now. And I see that this is a dog head with a bodybuilder's chest, arms. I mean, this thing is, is huge. It's eight or nine foot plus now that I can compare it to the things around it. I just, I couldn't believe it. It looked, it looked pretend. It looked like, um, I, I can't even explain. I'm so terrified at this point. I didn't know what to do, but the shotgun and him jumping completely broke me out of this trance that I was in of being a complete fool and sitting there not knowing what to do next. So I start the buggy up. I crank the wheels all the way to the left. The back tires are spinning, throwing dirt behind me. This thing is to the floor. I get it spun right around, and I'm headed to the road, and I'm screaming to Gene, what the hell was that? And he's screaming, my gun's jammed, my gun's jammed. And I'm looking over at the shotgun, and I'm looking forward, looking over at the shotgun, looking forward, and I'm screaming at him to hurry up, hurry up, get it loaded, get it loaded. I don't know where this thing is. I don't know when it's coming back. I'm trying to reach down for my pistol. And I'm reaching, but it's bouncing around on the floor somewhere because this dirt road's got little stones in it and it's bumps and the water knocks out out of a bunch of the dirt. So there's divots everywhere. There's mud holes as you get down into there. And we're two miles. We're two miles into the woods now. And it's dark. There's nothing else around us. We are, and in my perspective, we're a long way from home. And the gun that he has next to him is jammed. And I'm not sure what our next move is. The only thing I could do was keep my foot on that gas. I see Gene look up and he looks by me. Man. I look to the left side where he's looking out my window on the driver's side. And I'm doing about 50 at this point. That I look out the left-hand side next to us, about two foot next to me. I see this creature. It's running right next to us. This thing is on two legs, running directly next to us, on its back haunches like a dog. 
its arms are hanging in front of it like it's going to tackle something, like it's about to fall. But it's got its arms in front of us hanging down, and it's running next to me. I can hear its feet hitting the ground, even with this vehicle that we're in to the floor. I can hear it boom, 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 just taking big strides right next to us. And it's got its head down a little ways. Now, this buggy is about five and a half foot tall. This thing is hunched over, almost leaning forward like it's going to fall. But it wasn't. I could see now all the little teeny creases of its muscles that are in its body, on its body. I could see the hairs were blackish gray, and they were thin enough to be able to see that it did have skin underneath. And this thing was so ripped, I see its abs contracting and getting loose again as it breathes running next to me. I can see its muscles get tight in its legs because they're right where my face is. I look out and look back, and I am completely terrified. At this point, I don't, I can't even make a sound. I can't scream or, or even, I can't get any words out. I don't, I can't believe that this thing's running next to us at a full sprint. I mean, I, I don't personally know if it was at a full sprint, but I had this thing to the floor and it was standing right next to us, leaning down, looking into the window. I see its eyes. And again, there are these amber colored looking eyes. And I was, I was more terrified than I could ever dream of in my life. And I'm trying to get this thing moving as quick as possible. Gene's just. And Gene's staring at this thing, and all the color drained right out of his face. I'm sure mine did as well. And I'm I'm just looking forward, looking over. I'm hoping that he loads this thing up. I've got one arm on the steering wheel and one hand down now, trying to find what it is that's going on. And I crank the wheel to the right to try to move further away from this thing. Vic, this thing puts its arm out. Now I can see its hand, clear daylight, so to speak, with... The front two lights of the buggy shining straight on this thing. Its hand is massive. It has five fingers and these black, long, sharp nails. It's got its hand, puts it right on the driver's side light. And I feel the buggy starting to slow down. And I'm thinking to myself, no way. This thing has the intelligence to put its hand in front of the vehicle, put it on the vehicle I was in and put its hand on the light, and I remember looking forward, and I could see the light completely cut off the whole left side of the trail, because the only thing that we've got for light right now is the two front lights pointing forward, and it is dark as out. So I see this hand in front of me holding its back. I feel the buggy slowing down, and I look back over at him, and as I can see it, he's looking in, and I see his teeth. They are so sharp. Unlike a dog's that would be rounded at the end, these are sharp. And I'm talking serious sharp. I can hear them. He's chomping down repetitively. Boom, 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 boom. And I can see that every time he chomps down, I can hear it next to me. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm looking over at him, looking forward, looking over, looking forward. He's got his hand on the front. This vehicle slowing down. I got it all the way to the floor. I could feel the vehicle slow, and I could hear the weight and the strain on the motor as I'm trying to push forward. This thing's maybe 150 horsepower. It's not much, but I can feel it slowing down, and I'm getting real scared now. And I see this thing, and I, this sounds this sounds insane. This creature, as it's looking inside of the vehicle with its hand on my vehicle, both of us are in there. Slowing down, I thought, this is it. We're done. It smiles. Its lips curl up on the side, and it smiles. And I am just in complete fear, shook to my core. I have absolutely no clue what to do. I felt like it had taken everything from me that I've ever known to be good and true, and it had completely smashed it to the ground. This thing's aura. Its whole demeanor, it was just the most evil thing I've ever felt in my life. It projected this level of being emotionally distraught and just 
completely terrified, worse than if it was the end of the world or you'd lost your entire family or or anything. It was, I don't understand how it was able to make me feel that way, but it was beyond fright. It was beyond being terrified. It completely drained my soul. This thing was beyond evil. And I see this smile and I mean, at this point, there's nothing I'm not going to believe because I'm where I am right now. Everything starts flashing through my head. This is the end of my life. I have memories that I want to create with my family. What about the last person that I argued with? I <laughs> I didn't get to even apologize to them. I don't want to end like this. I have goals that I want to achieve. I want to try to be the best version of myself. And I have character flaws, as everyone else does, that I need to work on. I have things that I regret, that I wish I would have done differently, experiences that I wish I would have taken advantage of. And I'm thinking to myself, my whole life is literally flashing in my head, boom, 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 different things. And when they say your life flashes before your eyes, it really does. And I wasn't able to even do anything. It's just, I'm looking forward, trying to drive, looking at this creature. And I didn't know what else I was supposed to do. I'm thinking about my baby girl and I'm thinking about my wife and what what's going to happen? How are they going to find me? How are they going to provide? Uh, my, my daughter and my wife have to grow up without anybody around. What's the story that's going to be told? Accident in the woods? Vehicle accident? I know it's not going to say huge freaking wolf man attacks guys in woods. We both know it's not going to say that. So I'm racking my brain here and I am completely distraught. And all of a sudden I hear boom. And at the same time, I see Gene has the shotgun pointed in front of my face. Now we're sitting side by side going forward towards the road in the woods he reaches to his left and points the gun. The barrel's directly in front of me, but I'm looking forward. So it's about to shoot to the left where this creature is. And as soon as he pulled it up, I see this thing disappear out from next to me. And he still fires, but he had missed it. My ears are ringing. I see this thing. He's gone. How does this creature have the intelligence to be able to completely stop that it saw that that gun was pulled up it knows what it did to it I could see it ripped up its chest ripped up again when it was running next to us it knows what the consequences are from the end of that barrel because just prior it had felt that it knows and when that firearm got held up this thing let go of the front of the vehicle. I felt the strain and the load be taken off the motor. We speed back up, and this thing's gone. And I'm like, wow, how did it realize that that's what was going on? Now, I don't know how much time had gone by. It felt like about two hours. So now, as we're getting down the road, I'm thinking to myself, this thing's just smirked at me like an almost taunting type of deal. It was about to stop our buggy completely and it, it reaches out with man's hands with claws I mean, what is all this I'm, I'm 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 out of control trying to think of everything but i'm glad that it's not next to me anymore but i'm still terrified because i have no clue where this thing is i hear it now crashing into the woods next to us again the same sound i heard as we were coming in and this thing is just Boom, 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 blasting through all these woods next to us, through branches, through everything. I, I just like, okay, next time he comes in, we're going to get hit and we're going to get hit hard. And all I could do is keep it to the floor, but it stays in the woods over there for the next maybe 12 seconds. It didn't come back out yet. And I'm like, we're, dude, we're not going to make it to the road. And all I'm saying to Gene is, when that thing comes back out, hit it again, hit it again, hit it again. And he's got a gun out the window, aiming it out there. I'm driving forward, and we hit the road. It seemed like it was forever, but we finally hit the road. I didn't slow down. I hit that road. I cranked the wheel all the way to the right. The back tires slid off the gravel and onto the road. Tires are are squealing, and then I see it. It tried to flank us, 
it tried to jump out right there at the edge of the woods and cut us off. Or so I thought that's what it tried to do. But I get to turning, I slid, we lost speed sliding onto the road, but I still got it to the floor. Gene, I can feel him lean over onto me because of the G-force from, from turning at, at 40 miles an hour, you know, skidding onto the road. This thing jumps clear, easy, another 20, 25 foot out of the woods onto the side of the road where the ditch is, and now it's behind us. And we're going down the road, and Gene's got the gun pointed back to it, and he's not he's not shooting anymore, though. And as soon as he gets the gun pointed, when we straighten the vehicle out, he's got the firearm pointed down back behind us where this thing's standing. And it kind of leans down a little bit, and I see it go back down on all fours. And it's sitting there. It lets out this huge roar again, the same noise that I had heard numerous times with my wife earlier when we were in the woods and when I was by myself coming home prior to Gene and I going out in the woods when I had just walked in the house before my wife showed me the scratch. And all the cows went crazy. So we're getting down the road. Now this thing, he sees the gun get pointed back out, goes down on all fours, and then launches back over into the woods, another 20, 25 foot. And now I can't see him because it's as dark as it is. I can still see the silhouette from down there, though. So it launches back into the woods, and we get back to the house. I pull in. I stop, and we sit in the vehicle for a second. I have the garage door opener in the uh, buggy, and I pull it into the garage door, and I'm staring behind me. And now I reach down. I grab my pistol, which is a uh, three fifty seven Magnum. It's a, a five-shot revolver. It wouldn't have done anything to this creature. It got shot clear 18 feet away with a high brass slug from 12-gauge, and it just ripped its chest open. This thing didn't even care. It just pissed it off. So I've got my pistol, my hand shaking, and I've got this thing pointed out in the back. And I see Gene's got the shotgun on his side pointed out towards the back. And we watch as the garage door slowly closes. I'm waiting to see this thing's feet just show up and rip the door off. And the spot between where the door closes and the concrete's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't see it yet. I don't see it yet. And we sit there. Finally closes all the way. Now, I'm thinking, I've got to get inside. My family's inside. So we shut the buggy off. I open the door. I look outside. I don't see it. I don't hear it. So we get going back in, and I get inside, and I'm looking at Gene. We're not saying anything at first. And I pop the door open, and I I said, uh, hey, I said, uh, we're back. And I didn't, I didn't know what else to say. I didn't want to say anything running inside the house like a crazed lunatic trying to explain that we were just attacked by a werewolf. That my wife's going to tell me to stop drinking. You're an idiot. I wasn't able to even explain anything, and nor did I want to, because I'm going to put the fear in my family, two girls in the house. No, I can't do that. But I did want to check to see where they were. And they were in the living room. And I said, can you go upstairs for a minute? I want to come up and talk to you. Grab Gianna and go up there. I, I have something that I want to discuss with you, but I want you to go up there real quick. Gene and I will be up in a minute. And, uh, I close the door and I come back out into the wood room and I'm sitting back there and I look at Gene and I said, dude, what the f- was that thing? And he said, Brandon, I, I don't know. That's not supposed to be real. I said, that, that was, that was a werewolf. And he said, that, that's, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And he's the one that had said it looked like the werewolf from Van Helsing. And I that's when it clicked in my head and immediately I was like, yeah, you're right. It did. That's the only thing that I could compare it to that I've ever seen. And it's only been in a movie. So how is this thing over here? I've never seen this thing before. I've been in the woods since I've been old enough to squeeze the trigger. I've never seen anything like this. Now my heartbeat's slowing down. I'm kind of gaining some type of sanity back. Trying to think about what this thing could have been and nothing other than I mean, a stereotypical werewolf from a movie. So now I'm in fear that this thing's going to come into my house because it's got my scent. It's pissed. Gene blew its whole right pectoral muscle clean off its body. It's bleeding. It's mad. I don't know what's supposed to happen next. I'm trying to think, did we piss it off? I do remember, I'm trying to think if we pissed it off originally from coming in and, and all the deer running out, It was I took its food away or something. I would imagine that it eats deer. I love venison. Why wouldn't something else? I mean, let's be real here. 
I couldn't believe what I had just seen, and I didn't really know what else to say to Jean. All I said was, please don't say anything, after we had discussed what had happened in, in details of the thing, so we could both kind of recap on what it was that we saw. I kind of said, please don't say anything to Carissa, please don't say anything yet until we can figure out what's going on here. And I said, I'm going to go inside, and he said, I need to get back to my house right now. And I said, okay, I understand. Please give me a call when you get home. I mean, we only talked for about 15 minutes and just going over what we had seen. And it was a very difficult conversation because it's not supposed to be real. And we both, we both just were completely stunned that this creature was physically standing in front of us and it had done what it had done. And the level of intelligence of this thing was beyond any tree, any creature that I've ever seen. I mean, this was smarter than, than some humans that I associate with. It was intense. So I said, please call me when you get home. Well, I know that you made it home. I need to go inside and figure out what I'm going to do. And I said, please, again, please don't say anything to my wife. And he said, I won't if you don't. So I said, okay. He said, I said, let's meet up tomorrow. Call me when you get home. So he leaves. He calls me and says, I made it home. He's only about two and a half, three miles up the street. He gets home okay, no issues. I go upstairs, and she goes, so what the hell was that? And I didn't want to tell her at first, which I have since then. I said, this is a uh, coyote issue out there and some type of dog thing. And I didn't want to lie to her, but I didn't want to put the fear of God in her as I was feeling. I would never want anybody that I care about to feel the way I was feeling. No way. It took the trust away that I had from going into the woods. I don't want anybody else to lose that love they have for being able to enjoy the outdoors. That's a terrible thing. So I said to her, it was uh, an issue with some dogs. And she goes, what do you mean? What kind of dog? Coyotes? And I said, yeah, something like that. And uh, I didn't sleep that night. And I didn't say much to my wife. But as uh, as I get up the next day and kind of get things back together, I, I said, um, I finally sat down with her and, and I told her, she goes, what's going on with you? You are you're not sleeping. You're not paying attention to things. You're not doing the things that you normally do. And you haven't you know, gone to work today. I told her I didn't feel good in the morning. I didn't go to work. I hadn't slept anything. I said, uh, you know, I'm not going to work today. I'm, I'm calling in. I just, I don't feel right. And uh, I wasn't excited to get up and help cook. And, and I wasn't playing around tinkering around with stuff and going to get the firewood and loading up in the wood stove or anything like that. I mean, I spend most of the summer cutting and splitting firewood to keep my family warm, you know, and I'm excited to be able to say that I'm the one that had done that work to be able to keep the family warm. You know, I like to be that type of man. I like to be able to do the work, see the difference I've made, you know, fixing the house, doing anything, electrical, windows, siding, painting even, any type of remodeling stuff, I like to know that I did that. I fixed this for my family. I kept my family warm and did this. I fed my family with the, the squirrel or the rabbit or the deer or whatever it may be, or the fish that I caught, anything. So I didn't. I wasn't even doing any of that. That's my ritual to get up and throw wood in the wood stove. And she said, something's going on with you. You need to tell me the truth. What did you see in those woods the other night? And I said, okay, you're not going to believe this. And I sat down and I went through what I had told her, just as I had told you. And it scared her. I left out some details, that's for sure. But I explained to her what it was, and I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't want you going outside. I don't know what to do yet. And she said, you need to call the police. And I said, honey, the police aren't going to do anything. They're going to look at me like I'm an idiot. They're going to tell me to lay off the weed or something. They're going to tell me to lay off the drinks. I don't know what they're going to say. So finally, a little more time went by and I thought, you know what? I am going to call the police. I'm going to go through and I'm just going to let them know I've got something in the woods, some type of rabid dog. I think that's what I'll go with, I said. So I call them up and I say, this is what's going on to at least get them to come out. So Keewa County Sheriff shows up. It's a small town, so I know him personally. He shows up. I explained to him, you know, this is what's going on. He comes over with a couple of DEC officers. They pull in the driveway. 
I say, uh, hey, how you doing? And he goes, not much, Brandon. I mean, like I said, small town, first name basis. He said, what exactly is going on? And I said, can I talk to you privately for a minute, please? And he said, of course. And uh, he told the BBC guys who I've never met or seen before, you know, hang out there for a minute. And I pulled him aside and I said, listen, I had an incident with Gino the other night. And uh, I sat down and explained to him and I said, what I'm about to tell you, you got to promise me that you actually look into it and you believe me. And my reputation of I'm not a big drinker. I uh, stay away from any of that type of stuff, really. I don't mind a few beers once in a while. Nothing wrong with that. But uh, I like to stay in control. I like to know what's going on around me. And uh, I've built my reputation on being able to be heard and, and understood and believed. And uh, this was just completely out of character for me to be able to explain. But I did. And as I'm explaining to him, what it was, he believed everything and he was straightforward with me and I was straightforward with him. And everything was fine up until the point when I started explaining what this creature looked like. And I saw the blood drain out of his face, just like I did Gene's that night when we shined the spotlight on him. And as he's writing notes about what it is that took place, he stopped. And he went from comfortable to uncomfortable. And I mean real quick, Vic. He closed his little book and he looked at me and he said, are you sure that's what you saw? And I said, I'm 100% positive. And he goes, uh, all right, sit tight. And he goes back to his vehicle, and he makes a phone call. And uh, he comes back, and he says, uh, I think we can have this dealt with. He said, um, I'm going to come back tomorrow, and uh, we'll do something a little bit further on this. And I said, what's going to happen? You know, what do, How are we going to deal with this? And he said, I'm not sure. And it looked like he had known what it was that was going on because he obviously was familiar with a scenario that's similar to this. He called somebody. You know, I could see a look in his face. that He was terrified as well. Maybe he was reliving a situation that he got into, an encounter he got into. I don't know. I can only speculate on what was going through his head. But I knew that he was familiar with what it was that I had spoke to him. So he makes the phone call. Fast forward to the next day here, nothing else happened that night. I don't hear any more screams, nothing. Now, we get to the next day here, and uh, the sheriff pops back over. Now, he's got this van or big enclosed truck thing with him, all black, and he's got this guy with him. He pulls in in front. The other vehicle, this big bulky-looking thing, pulls in behind him. And I see him on the cameras because I got cameras all around the house. And when you pull in the driveway, it's got sensors on each side so that you can hear the ding inside the house and know that someone's pulling in the driveway. And I see the cameras. I see these vehicles. And I'm like, okay, they're here back again to deal with this incident. I'm like, perfect. I said, I'll be back in, honey. I'm going to go handle this. So I go out. He comes out and says, uh, hey, this is uh, so-and-so. I don't even remember at the time. I was just completely distraught because his outfit looked like some type of military uniform or, or, or some type of military unit. But I'd never seen any of the badges on there. There wasn't any writing. It was just this weird symbol of a, a badge on there. It wasn't anything that I was familiar with. And uh, I shook his hand and he said, you're Brandon? I said, yeah. And uh, he goes, run by me again exactly what had happened. So I took a couple minutes, and uh, I explained to him in general what it was that was going on. At that point, I can see he's got a pistol on his hip. And at that point, he motions over this wave or whatever, and I look over. Now, five more of the same type of people, the same type of outfits, gets out of this black van truck thing. Now, as they get out, they all have pistols on, and they have these strapped, what looks like some type of smaller machine gun, SMG, maybe even fully automatic firearm hanging around their neck. And I mean, these guys are some type of professionals here, some type of government professionals. I've never seen anything like this in my life, and I'm very familiar with all the military outfits and uniforms. I've never seen this. So they come out, and they come up, and he goes back over and talks to him. and now my wife's coming out, and she's going, what the hell is this? What is going on? And I said, go back inside for a minute. I'm not sure yet. 
And I talked to the sheriff and I said, what's, go- what's going on here? I said, what, what is this? And he goes, they'll, they'll handle it. They know what to do. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've got a lot of questions right now. I don't know who these people are. What's going to go on? Are they going on a hunt for this thing right now? That's all I can think of. They're strapped up like they're going to World War III. You know, so they come back over. He said something to them quick there. I don't know what it was. And uh, they come back over, and he has me explain the area where they went, excuse me, where I went, down into the woods. And as they start heading over that way, I see them. They have this, one of them has this, it looks like a satellite disc with a smaller satellite disc in the middle. The wider one's about a foot and a half long. The other one that's inside of that one, the other cone part, is only about five, maybe four inches long. So I'm looking at this thing, and I'm thinking, what is that little device? Maybe a loudspeaker or something. What are they going to do, yell for this thing in the woods? Or maybe they're going to yell to each other. I don't know. But as soon as he puts it out in front of him, I'm in the middle of a conversation that I can't even tell you what it was about at the moment now that I come back and think of it. But I, I was just so distracted because he points this thing out in front of him. It looks like a, it's got a hand grip and a trigger on it. And he hits this thing. And my dog, I've got a year old pit bull, about 90 pounds, big girl, Maya. Very healthy. Never had any problems with her. Spent a lot of time with her in and out of the woods. She's trained like you wouldn't believe. Never have any issues. I look over and I see her quizzed up in a ball, shaking like she's having a seizure. I don't know what's going on with her. She's whimpering and crying and screaming. She can't even get up. And I'm thinking, hey, whoa, 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 what's going on here? What, what, why is my dog doing this? And as soon as I had yelled over to that, they had this thing sticking out in front of them, pointing towards the woods. They put it back down. And as soon as they put that device back down, Maya stood up. She stopped doing the seizure thing and crying, and she came right over to me and sat next to me. She was scared, nervous. I didn't know what happened. I'm sure she didn't know what the happened to her. And I'm yelling over, hey, what, what was that? What is that thing? What are you guys doing right now? And he said, we'll be back up shortly to have a conversation with you in a minute. And I'm looking over at the sheriff, and I'm shaking my head with wide eyes like, what the going on here man what what was this did you just see what this did to my dog so they go out and they come back a couple hours later maybe two two to three and a half hours later now the sheriff's gone at this point he told me basically that i was in good hands and they'll take care of it but he never really discusses anything or reveals any information about this creature that he's familiar with or, or or anything it's kind of a quick high and by i'm handing this off to them now, these got to be some type of government people because I've never seen this outfit, as I said before, and they had some type of devices and, and things that I've never, I'm not familiar with. It did something, some type of sound wave or some type of energy that came out of that thing that put my dog into a mess. I didn't hear it and I didn't feel it. must be something only that animals or dogs can hear. I'm not sure. I'm speculating on that. So they come back about two and a half, three hours later. And uh, they knock on the door. I see them walking back up in the cameras because originally when they had gone to leave, they jumped back in the vehicle after they pointed that thing out into the woods. They went back in the vehicle and they drove it down the dirt road. So they come back. I see them pulling back up. And I said, uh, so what's going on here? What did we figure out, guys? And the other four are over in the woods. They got a couple bags with them, I see, too. So they're over near their van. And I'm talking to this guy, and I said, well, what outfit are you guys with? And he ignored my question, and he said, i got to ask you a couple questions. And I said, okay. So we ran through some things, and a couple of these questions that he asked were, did you take any pictures that day? And I said, no, it was the middle of the night, pretty much. It was 8.30, 9.30 at night. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yes, I am. And he goes, okay. And uh, before he had left, he had asked about the deer cams and things before they had went in the woods, and I told him that I got about 30 out there. And uh, he goes, okay. So we went through a conversation of asking if I had what I had come to realize, any physical proof of this creature, which he obviously didn't want me to have. And, you know, I'm no dummy here. I could see that they were looking 
to see if there was any type of proof of anything and they wanted it in their possession. Now, come to find out, they go to leave. They say that they'll talk to me, you know, shortly. We'll make sure that we get in contact with you. As for right now, you should be all set. And I said, what does that mean, all set? I have a lot of questions here. I need to know what it is that's going on, and I need to know right now. I'm concerned about my well-being, my family's well-being, and all of my free time <laughs> is spent in the woods. I, I can't even go back in there right now unless I know what it is that's going on. I, I don't know. High-powered rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Black powder, that's all I got in this gun safe. I don't know what I'm supposed to do to keep myself safe to go out there. You know, I need some answers. And he said, we need to look a little further into this, and we'll get back in touch with you. For right now, you're all right. Just sit tight. And I said, okay, I don't know what that means, but I'm trying to get more out of him. He won't give it to me. So he goes to leave. As he leaves, I'm trying to look at the license plate. I'm trying to see if I got it on camera. I can't see the license plate. It has some tint thing. There is a license plate. It is a New York license plate, and I can't make it out. I tried to look on the cameras. Couldn't make it out. I want to know who these guys are and what it is that's going on. They're obviously on my team, but they're hiding something because to ask if I had anything, if I have this, I have that, you know, they want a possession of it. So next couple days, I get the courage to go out. And I end up going out there all strapped up like some type of army vet. I get out there, and there's a couple of the deer cams that I've got next to the edge of the woods. Now, I can see the dogs going back outside. I can see over the next day that the cows are back up next to the edge of the woods. And I'm thinking, okay, I feel a little bit safer. And obviously, daylight, because you can see what your surroundings are, you feel a little bit safer. It's important to always be aware of your surroundings, especially with finding out that there's more creatures than you originally knew were on this planet. So I get out. There's a couple deer cams close to the line of the uh, edge of the field and the head drawn. I don't want to go too deep in there. I'm not ready for that yet. But I pop a couple of them open, and wouldn't you know it, all the SD cards are gone. Every one that I had checked on the edge of the woods. Now, I have to check the other 20-something, but I can bet you any amount of money Okay, I'll bet you my favorite fishing pole that all of them are gone too. There is no way that they said to me, do you have any deer cams? How many? And all of a sudden all the SD cards are gone? Let's get real here, guy. There's no way. So they're going to review all those, see if they captured anything. And I wish I would have known at the time because I would have pulled them. I don't know if I would have been able to get deep into the woods to get all those. But I would have pulled as many as I could to see what I had on there. Because it didn't come to mind, but they beat me to it. So, I'm still waiting to hear back from them. And uh, at this point in time, this was less than a month ago. It would be a month ago, March 2nd, which is coincidentally my birthday. But I'm hoping now that it's been a month that I haven't had any other issues. I haven't heard any of that screaming. The cattle is back to its normal routine throughout the day. And I'm hoping uh, that this will continue and I can continue to move forward with being able to gain my love back for the woods and lose a lot of this fear because that is my favorite place to be. But I'll tell you from what I saw last month, Anything is possible at this point. I like to remain open-minded and remain teachable. And that was a very humbling experience because I didn't realize that something like that would grow and something like that would actually exist. This thing was ready to take anything on and it was bigger than any creature I've ever seen. It, it was just beyond imaginable. And to think that I have my family there and I'm completely helpless. I thought about moving them. We got to get out of here, I'm thinking. And then I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that I'm going to let this thing push me away from my house. I've worked really hard to have what I have at 30 years old. There is no way I'm letting this thing beat me. But over the next week or so, I couldn't sleep well. I was not focusing on things. All I could keep thinking is I'm going to see this thing through my window one day and it's going to blast through and it's going to take my family. It's going to, I don't know what it's capable of. 
I have no clue what it's capable of. But whatever created this thing, I don't know what it was thinking. This thing is just a damage machine. It is ready all the time to just go from zero to a hundred in full attack mode. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. But I know for sure that I definitely am not going to be going back in the woods anytime soon. And that's a sad thing because it's taken something from me, Vic. It's taken my ability to be comfortable and be able to enjoy the woods and share the outdoor experiences with my family and friends and ones that I care about, be able to create memories with those friends and family that I care about. It's taken that away from me. All right, so we finished that one. And again, that's from Vic's Dogman Encounters. Go check out his channel. There's a lot of other good stories. But we're going to move on here. And the next channel we're going to take a look at is Sasquatch Chronicles. And I think there's a lot of good stuff on this one. This is one of the legends. And there are a couple other channels. But again, this is a very tight niche with the telephone interview based stories. So I think that this is going to be a couple rare ones that are kind of hard to find. Okay. Um, well, actually, my, my kind of my first encounter uh, happened. This was in uh, 2004. And we were on our, I, I live in, um, we'll say, central Kentucky. And um, I was heading home from one of the major cities here. And uh, on the way home, I had a little Chevy Trailblazer. And uh, <laughs> I was driving, and one of the lug nuts broke on it. And as, you know, as I get going down the road again, a, a couple more of them break. So, you know, I decided, you know, I have my pregnant wife in the vehicle with me. I said, you know, I'm going a, I'm to a slow down. So I'm going like, um, you know, I, I went a total of 30 miles and it took me like almost three hours to get there. As we're passing through uh, probably about a quarter mile away from where this incident happened, we had the windows down and it was, it was you know, it was pretty chilly that night. And often uh, there's a dry creek bed that was running alongside the road. It sounded like it sounded like a like a, a bulldozer running through the trees. And I mean, it really, really, really freaked me out. And I never, in a million years, thought that you know that if somebody said, "Hey, there's a Bigfoot over there," I'd have been like, "Man, you're out of your mind." <laughs> yeah. it's about like the story I'm about to tell you. I mean, if I wasn't there, I, I wouldn't believe it. I mean. It's, you know, if somebody told me if somebody was to tell me this story and I didn't know what I know, I would be like, man, this person really needs to be checked into a mental hospital. But um, my first encounter is uh, there's this uh, it's a abandoned rock quarry and it has a really good size. Uh, I, I see I call it at the glorified pond and everybody else would probably call it a lake. It's pretty good size. And, uh, you know, when I would ride my motorcycle, I loved going out there because it was uh, it was absolutely quiet. It was peaceful. It was somewhere to go, you know, just to clear my thoughts. And um, another, another thing about it is, too, is while I was out there, you know, there was a little bit of strangeness in there. I never really thought about, um, I, I, I couldn't say that I was actually being, you know, felt somebody staring at me, as people would say. I, I never felt that way, but it was just a. It was kind of an eerie feeling, but it was also a tranquil feeling. So um, pretty much, you know, if I took a long ride, I would always go back and stop at this, stop at this, stop this lake and, you know, sit out there and smoke cigarettes, you know, collect my thoughts. Well, um, one day I was out there and this was probably in, uh, I can't remember. It was one of the summer months. It was probably June or July, August, one of the months. And it was, uh, actually it was in, it was in July is when it was. I was sitting there on the bank one day, and there's an abandoned building that sits there. And, you know, I walk in, and it, it was always really stinky in there. I mean, really, really stinky. And I never, I thought it was, you know, there might have been a dead deer in there or something. But, um, you know, I'm sitting I'm sitting on the bank next to this building, and I heard, like, it's it's like a, almost sound like a tree, like a, a snapping of a tree, like a branch or something. The next thing I hear is, uh, I heard Sounds like a, a kid crying, like a baby crying. And I'm sitting there, you know, I'm like, man, you know, this is, <laughs> I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm hearing this. So curiosity gets the best of me and I, I go over there and, you know, I'm walking through the, I was probably maybe three or 400, about 300 foot away from my bike at the time. And it's a pretty wooded area. And 
you know, I get to walk them through there and I, you know, this it keeps getting louder, keeps getting louder. And when I walked up on it and when I seen, when I seen, I thought it was, uh, like a, maybe a baby bear, uh, you know, a cub that was caught in this tree, but it was, I mean, it looked like a big cub, but as I got up on it, I realized that's not what it was. And it turns around and looks at me and it, it looked like a, a kid, like a child, a baby, and looked like um, a part chimp. And, you know, it, I'm standing there looking at this, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> what am I looking at? And it's, the, I mean, it's it's the wildest thing in the world. I never, you know, ever heard nothing about Bigfoot growing up. I didn't, I probably seen Harry and the Andersons, but it was the last thing that was in my mind. I'm sitting there looking at this, and and I look, and the, the, the creature, the animal, I call them animals, was upside down and had his leg caught like in the wide part of the tree and it's squalling and going crazy and it looks at me and I mean the look on his face it really wasn't a look of fear it was a look of pain I could tell it was in pain and I'm sitting there thinking you know should I should I try to help this out I, I didn't know what it was will it hurt me and so I'm sitting there judging debating on this and all of a sudden it, it, the um, the baby we'll call it the baby the baby stops crying and just stares off, and this whole demeanor on his face changed. Well, I look to see where he's looking at, and there's another one. Only she's a lot taller. I'm six foot two, and she probably had four or five inches on me, so I put her at about six and a half foot. I'm sitting there staring at that one, you know, just, I'm frozen. I don't know what to do. All of a sudden, another one comes behind from behind the tree, and they're both females. And the reason I know they were females is because, you know, they had breasts. They were hairy, but you could tell what they were. And I'm sitting here, and I'm looking at I'm looking at the two big ones. I'm looking at the baby, and the other one that stepped out from behind the tree must have been its mother, and she was she was every bit of eight foot tall, and she wasn't she wasn't big. She wasn't, you know, like uh, like the uh, the patty type, I guess they would call it. She was more uh, slender. And she looks at me and she growls and yells. I mean, loud, extremely loud. So I get scared and I run back and I get on my motorcycle and I haul ass. Well, that, uh, that same night, you know, I'm at home and, you know, I'm feeling worded out about this. And, you know, it, it was kind of hard to collect my thoughts on what I had just seen. The next day, you know, I'm supposed to get up and go to work, and I, for some reason, I ended up getting sick. And I was sick for like uh, three or four days straight, and it was it was not like a, a flu sickness. It was more of a, I felt like I had a hangover and like I'd been punched in my head a few times. Yeah, kind of like you've been poisoned. Yeah, like yeah, like I've been poisoned. And I don't know if that's what they call the infrasound, what that, whatever that was. I ended up taking the next couple of weeks off of work and, you know, cause you know, I, I didn't know what had happened. And, um, during this two week period, I, I ended up talking, I talked to my grandfather. He's the only person that, you know, I had told about it at this time. And I, he believed me and he told me, you know, you gotta, you know, cause I told him I was scared about it. He was like, you have to face your fears. And, you know, I'm sitting there thinking maybe, <laughs> Did, did I have a mental breakdown out there and, and really didn't see this stuff? So I'll go back out there probably about, it's probably about three weeks to a month later. Well, before we go into that, because this mm -hmm. is where it starts to get really, really fascinating. Uh, not that it isn't already, but talk about what, what did the creature look like? The one that you walked up on. And then if you would, for the audience, describe the two, the other two that you saw the, the best you can from what you remember. Okay. Um, well, the the baby that was in the tree it looked like a it looked like a a, a chubby kid. It's body wise. It looked like a little chubby kid covered in hair. I'd say it was probably it, it was maybe about four foot tall, three and a half, four foot tall. And but the face looked so it looked more human than it did monkey. It had the um, the nose was. It had a human nose, but it was it was a, a lot wider. Not real big, but a little bit wider. 
and it was a uh, it was a chocolate color, chocolate brownish color, we'll say. And um, the the first female that stepped out, she was probably you know she had a she like I was saying she's she was probably about six 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 seven. I know she had five or six inches on me, and she was she was slender. She was a she was a golden color. I guess you would call it blonde, but it not really blonde to me. It looked more gold than anything, and uh, she looked a lot like a Native American. So and I was a uh, so go all, ahead. all all three of them had kind of had a human like appearance from where you oh were. yeah look yeah. look very human, but the um, the big one that stepped out she <laughs> you could tell she had a little bit of an animal in her. And when you say that, what do you, what do you mean? Maybe, maybe I'm saying that because of the way she growled at me and screamed, but she looked more, um, she had more of the chimp look to her, but the, uh, but the first one that stepped out, I mean, I I mean, you know, she was, she was beautiful. I mean, not saying, uh, you know, her face wise is just her standing there. It's, It's something I had never seen before. I mean, I'm, this story is, <laughs> I know it, this is hard to believe, and it, I know everybody out there is going to think I'm crazy, but it's the God's honest truth. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm i fascinated by it. Um, and so all three of them looked more human-like, except for the very old, the oldest one looked more, um, kind of had an animal look. Is that what you're saying? Animal, yeah, she had an animal look. And the, uh, the one, the, the golden one, the first one that stepped out, I mean, she was, she was slender. But she, I mean, she was, had muscles, but she, I mean, she had a, you know, she had a, she had the smaller waist and she had hips on her. You could tell she was, she was younger and you could tell she was in her youth, maybe, maybe, maybe going through, I guess what we would have is puberty. Yeah. And then the older one, obviously you could tell it was an older one. Oh yeah. You could tell she was older one. You could tell she, uh, she looked a little rough. And let me ask you, what, so what, what's going through your mind at this point? You leave, you go home, and I, I can hear hear it in your voice when you and I talked the other night, and I completely get it. You almost kind of, and, and it's hard for people to understand this, but when you experience something like this, you almost want to go back. You want to see it again. You want to make sure I wasn't delusional the first time I saw this thing. And so I, I get completely, um, but well, what's going through your mind? I mean, what did you think you just saw? I, I didn't know. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, I had no one I could talk to. I had no internet. And, I, you know, I I didn't know what I seen. To be honest with you, I couldn't put it in no category of nothing that I knew. The The biggest shock was seeing the baby there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Seeing the, because I mean, it looked, like I said, it looked like a little chubby kid <laughs> hanging in the tree with a bunch of hair on it. Yeah, and, no. you know, I wanted to help and not, and you know, I might not have been, able, it looked heavy. You know, it, it was probably just as, you know, it was probably that height, but it was probably just as wide as me. And I, I'm 6'2", and I weigh probably uh, 215, 220. And, you know, when I get I got home that night, I just, I didn't know what to think. You know, I still was kind of, confi- you know, even after I found out what they were, uh, you know, I, I was still confused on it. Because, you know, when I, I when I seen that, the first time I seen that Patty type was the first one, you know, that I had actually seen. And, you know, I'd seen the movie Harry and the Henderson, but I mean, these didn't look nothing like that. They did, but they didn't. And so you go home and you're, you're obviously, this is on your mind. You take some time off work. I want to come back to you being sick. Um, but before we go into that, so what happens next? Do you uh, decide to go back out there? Yeah. Yeah. I went back. I go back out there and, you know, I go back out there and <laughs> I'm sitting there on the on the bank and you know trying to collect my thoughts and everything and you know it still had that eerie feeling, but a peaceful feeling. And I was think, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, did I have a mental breakdown in my head? What is, you know, what has happened to me? You know, at the time, you know, I was going through a lot of stress at the time with, you know, it as the first time I'd been married. First, you know, it was my second kid and. You know, I'm, you know, I end up having a kid with another woman and with, you know, with the, with my wife, but, you know, I didn't grow up with that like that. I grew up in a, you know, a single, you know, a, you know, both parents in my home and, you know, I was going through a lot of stress at the time and I thought maybe, maybe I had had a mental break, but 
as I get out there, um, you want me to tell it how I met the lady? Yeah, if you would. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I go back out there and, you know, I, I collect all my thoughts and everything. And as I'm going to leave, I, I think this was, you know, I went out there a couple more times after that. And, um, it was probably on my second or third time going back out there. I'm going to leave and <laughs> there's this old lady that is standing out there by my motorcycle. No, I left something out, Wes. Um, the first time I went out there, when um, I left, when I walked back to my motorcycle, there were three rocks, shiny, shiny rocks sitting on my gas tank. And I still have those to this day. I've made necklaces out of them. Yeah, I remember and, you telling me that, yeah. And uh, come, you know, they were gifts from the, from the, um, from the Sasquatch. I always refer to them as animals, but, but, um, so uh, it was on my second or third time going back out there. I'm going to leave and there, there's this old lady standing by my motorcycle. And I'm like, oh man, what, <laughs> you know, it, she's probably going to jump on me for being, a, you know, on this land, which I, I didn't know who it was, abandoned rock quarry, but I, I go out there a lot and I was like, oh man, here we go. So here's another thing. As I'm walking back to my motorcycle, she's like, excuse me. Excuse me, and I'm like, oh my God, this is, I'm about to get it from this old lady. And I walk up to her, and I'm like, hey, um, you know, hey, how are you doing? And everything, you know, we said our greetings to each other, and she's like, I want to thank you for saving the, helping the baby Hank out. Did you understand that Hank? Yeah, that's what she referred to. That's him as what she Hank. called him. Yeah, Hank called him Hank. Yeah, and I'm like, uh, I'm like, what? I'm like, what are you talking about? She was like, you helped the baby hang out. And, you know, I'm sitting, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what she was talking about. And when she was saying it to me, I wasn't thinking about my encounter or nothing. I just thought maybe she was a delusional old lady. Then she explained it to me and I'm sitting there looking at this and I'm like this, I guess, you know, I didn't have a mental breakdown. And, you know, I, I was like, you know, how, how would you know about this? And she tells me, they told me. <laughs> And she tells me, I, I'd seen this, you know, riding this road, I'd seen this old lady out in her yard a few times because I traveled the road a lot. And she tells me, she's like, stop, stop up to the house and see me. So, you know, I leave, you know, she goes walking back down. She didn't live that far away from there. She probably lived maybe, maybe not even a half mile. And if you cut through the woods, it probably wasn't a quarter of a mile. And, um, she, you know, she tells me to come out there and, and see her. So probably, probably about a week later, I go, you know, I'm out on my motorcycle and I said, I, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to talk to this lady. And I go to her house and she's sitting on her front porch and I get off on the bike and I walk up and talking to her. And I was like, please explain this to me. I, I was like, I don't know what I see. And she tells me that, you know, she was like, I, I know that you helped the baby out of the tree, which I didn't. I didn't even put no hands on the baby. And um, she also told me, she's like, she was like, I know that she said, I think she said its name. She was like, I know that she screamed at you. She was like, that's what they do when they're upset. And, you know, I'm, I'm asking her, you know, <laughs> you know, I had like a million things going in my head, but I didn't know what to say to her. You know, she's telling me about it. I can't remember what all we talked about, but she ends up she ends up, ends up inviting me into her house. We go in the house, and we're sitting there at the kitchen table, and she's telling, you know, she gives me a little bit of detail. She had been, like, communicating with them since the 70s. Also, another thing, when, uh, when I walked in her house, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was nasty in it. Not nasty, dirty-wise, but just a, a terrible, terrible odor. And a lot what of it, um, what did it smell like when you walked in? Uh, like a uh, like it smelled like a dairy uh, dairy cattle, and it smelled like a wet dog. It didn't. I, it, I never smelled no skunk smell, but I smelled the wet dog, and it, they smelled like it smelled like dairy cattle's in there, and they stink. Just kind of a wild, a, kind of a wild, oh, smell. Yeah. wild, 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 wild. And um, also, I noticed, you know, she had. She had a few holes in her walls in the house. It's, it's, you know, she lives in a really old house. 
It's a two-story house out in the country. The house is probably over 100 years old. We go and we sit down in the kitchen, and she's telling me, you know, she had been communicating with them since the 70s. And, you know, they're like her family. And, you know, while we're sitting down there, I hear something upstairs, and, you know, I didn't think nothing about it. I was like, maybe, you know, I, didn't, I don't know what I thought about it, to be honest with you. And she, she's sitting there, and all of a sudden, she, she, we're, she's sitting in this chair, and she leans her head back and starts making this clacking noise. Well, I heard something coming down the steps, two sets of something coming down the steps. And she walks like in the um, in the do- in the uh, entranceway into the kitchen, and she's standing there. And all of a sudden, peeking out behind her is the baby, <laughs> and another baby. And they're they're staring at me. I hear them sniffing, just constantly like that. And she's she's talking with them and making hand gestures with them, and they're talking back and forth. And I'm sitting here just just blown away. Was it one of the same one that you saw in the tree, or were they? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it was the same one. Yeah, you can't do. I mean, they all the ones that I've seen, all of them look different. All of them have their own look to them. And the, um, it was sorry about that. I'm still kind of when I get get to thinking about when I first seen all this, it kind of puts me in a kind of a weird place. No, no, I understand. And so, what happens next? They're um, you know, she, they're standing behind her and like, you know, like they're, she, she always wore these old sundresses and, you know, I, they both have their hands on her, on her dress and are peeking around at, at me and sniffing and sniffing. And she's telling, she, she, she ends up telling me, she said, don't worry, they don't bite too hard. <laughs> and I, and I, was saying, I thought that was, you know, it kind of broke the, broke the air in there. And. You know, she ends up, you know, she sits back down and they're sitting there and, and they're standing right beside her. And they're like, they have their heads down, but they're kind of looking at me and everything. And we're sitting there and like she has a, uh, she had some muffins sitting on the counter and they go over there and, and grab the muffins and are eating them. And it's, and it's just like, it's like the, it was these ladies' grandkids. And I know, I know everybody out there is probably like, he is lying his tail off. But yeah. This is the God's honest truth, and I don't know any other way to tell this but the way that I've seen it. You know, she's uh, she's there. Where was I with the muffins? Yeah, they grabbed the muffins and were eating the muffins. And, you know, she's telling me more about them and everything. I can't remember everything that she tells me. But on that first day I was out there when I met the babies, we was all in the kitchen, and all of a sudden there's uh, it's more clicking. It was more of a yell, but with, like, clicking in it. And the the two babies look up and the woman looks up. They all done the same kind of head motion. You know, I asked her, I was like, what was that? And she was like, that's Papa. And come to find out Papa's the alpha. And the two, the two juveniles, she walks into the door and, and is communicating with them, talking and making the, I don't know. It sounds like, uh, like that, but maybe a little bit different. Like um, if you put your tongue to the top of your throat, or to the yeah, to the top of your mouth, roof of your mouth, and that that kind of sound, kind of a popping sound, yeah, the popping sound, yeah. yes. And she walks into the door, and I'm still sitting in the. When you sit in her kitchen, you can see her whole backyard, all her woods, her gardens, her barns, and everything. And I see these two little juveniles take off running out the back, and they were they were upright running and. I mean, these things are fast. I mean, they went around there. It was like two lightning strikes. They were gone. And so, what so, happens uh, next? I know you. I know you went back, and we'll get to that. But do you? Do, I mean, what was the conversation like? Where you did you ask her what the hell are these things? What what's going on here? You know, I asked her. I, was, I don't know if I put it in that kind of context. What are they? I was like, you know, I just I kind of I asked her. I said, what is going on? And she. She, you know, like she told me, she's been communicating them with with them since the seventies, and she tells me that you know that, that that they help her out around the farm. She tells me that she keeps the she keeps the babies every second or third night while the the grown ups hunt. And it's like she almost kind of kind of runs like a little daycare there, and she said that she has rooms up there, and she told me she's been doing this with 
pretty much everyone that's in the troop. And she says once they get a certain age that, you know, they get too big and they can't come in the house. And when I, you know, when I seen what I seen, I understand why. Like the female, she could get in there, but she, I mean, her head would be through the door, through the roof. And yeah, um, It's interesting because I've heard things like this before in the past, but um, so do you guys eventually, does she tell you anymore? Or do you eventually just end up leaving? Um, I sat there talking to her, but you know, it was so much that, I mean, it was, it was so much information and, and things to take in at once. Cause I, it was like, I was, it was like being put on a different planet. It was something that I I didn't know. You know, I was, I, you know, she, she tells me, you, you know, like I said, she was telling me that, that they help her out around the, around the farm and the second time I went out there we went in the backyard and you know she shows me her garden and she says you know this is my side of the garden and that's that side of the garden she has a, a small pond that's, that she keeps stocked with fish for them and she had she had a, a few horses out there and she had I think that she was feeding them the, the horse food the horse feed food whatever you call it because I mean there was there was probably a three or four hundred bags of this food laying around, feed laying around. Also, another thing I didn't tell you about when we talked the other day, um, when I looked in her backyard, she has this, she has had a, when you go in the house, there's, there's an extension cord that's running out the back door with cable wire tied all the way around it. And she has a, a, a TV sitting out there for them. Oh, yes, also this too. I mean, this sounds crazy. I know. I'm sorry, but this is this is the truth. When I was in there, I noticed a lot of uh, toys, and a lot of the toys were SpongeBob. Well, she has this TV that she kept outside with cable on it, and she says that they she says that they all love SpongeBob. And I was out there. It was probably it was probably on my third time I went out there, and she had the TV on, and she was like, "Watch this," and she plugs it in, and she was like, "Give it just a minute." And I looked out there, and there was I. There was you could see their eyeballs everywhere, little sets of eyes everywhere out there. And I thought that was that was probably one of the neatest things. That was probably one of the most fascinating things I've seen. So what? So let me ask you. So you end up leaving. How many times do you go back to this property and talk to this uh, lady? I probably went out there five or six times. Well, tell us about the next time you went out and what she said, or if you saw any other creatures. Okay, uh, yeah, the, the next time I went out there, you know, we're we're in the house, and uh, we ended up going out on the front porch, and the first female that I'd seen was was there. It came up, and she was outside and communicating with it, and <laughs> I mean, this is going to sound horrible, I, I know, but, it, and the thing about it is, the... Um, I don't want to say the lady's name, but she ends up telling me that this particular animal, Bigfoot, is was eight years old. But she was, you know, six foot six, six foot seven. And like I was telling you, um, she was very, very mature. And <laughs> while I'm sitting there, you know, I'm, I'm looking, you know, I'm staring just like crazy. And... You know, I probably might have stared at her breast way too much. And I know everybody can think, ooh, that's sick. But it is what it is. <laughs> and yeah. she she gave me a she gave me a very, like, mean look and a dirty growl. Typical woman. T- typical woman. And, you know, they say <laughs> that they can read minds. And, you know, I wasn't thinking nothing like that. I hope I wasn't. Yeah. If I did, God forgive me. But, I mean, she was... She was she was very attractive, and there's this there's a picture on the internet, and it's it's old rare photos of like Native Americans, and if you look through there, there's there's a, a picture of a woman that looks very very similar to her. Well, it sounds odd to the audience, and you know, obviously for me, it sounds odd because. But having said that, um, I wasn't there. And Albert Otzman, <laughs> you know Albert Otzman, mm-hmm. the the Canadian. Yeah, that I heard claimed, his story. Uh-huh. The, and you and I were talking about this the other night. There's a portion of his story where I think there was more that went on there than what he says. Uh, because oh, yeah. he was very attached to the young female. And he even thought about taking the young female uh, away from there. And it makes you stop and go, well, why? 
Why why was he uh, so infatuated with with this young female? So um, I'm breaking your balls, but I I, I I I guess I get it to some extent. You know, I understand where you're coming from. Um, I mean, it's just I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. She was attractive. I'm I'm no, that's the only way to yeah. put it. And you know, she's you know, she's said you can't see her her lower area because it's very hairy. But you know, I mean, she had she has she was very tall and muscular, but she had a shape, and you know, she had a hairy little butt. <laughs> I guess I could say. And you know, she was. I mean, it was. It was fascinating, you know. She, it was it was a, it was a beautiful specimen, is the way I put it. No, I get it. I get it. You and know, so, you can go to the zoo and see a beautiful lion, and it's like, man, that that thing is really beautiful. Yeah, of course. So th- this thing is actually talking to the old woman uh, when mm-hmm. you ha- were there. This one was so obviously that's where the old woman knew that you had walked up, meant no harm. Obviously, they were communicating with her. And I want to come back to this because there's something I want to tell you about it, but. Um, I don't want to interrupt the story. So go ahead. So uh, she's talking with this one. What what happens next? Um, yeah, she's she's talking with the lady. She's talking with the woman, and the woman is sitting on the stairs, and the Bigfoot was there, and, you know, they're communicating, and I'm listening to this, and, you know, at the same time, I'm staring at her, and that's when she gave me the low growl. I guess I was staring actually too hard. And... um She's she's sitting there and she's like, "Give me just a minute," is what she tells me. She walks in the house and comes out with a big thing of muffins and gave to her, and she walked off. And that that was the that was the story on it. How, Second how, time I went out there. How were they communicating? Was it the same thing? Clicks and it was yeah the clicking the yeah the clicking of the mouth. But you know, I think some of them I don't know. I could have sworn when one of the, when the, remember I told you the two juveniles when I first went out there and they had left, I could have sworn one of them said bye. And maybe, maybe that was something in my head, but it, I, I could have swore I heard one of them say bye. But she was, she was, yeah, she was communicating with them and it, it was, a, it's a lot of hand gestures when she's talking. You know, she would, uh, she would make a lot of half circles with her hand. You understand what I'm saying? Like yeah. she would stick her hand out and make like a half circle. She 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 done that a whole lot. But it it wasn't no sign language. But it was it was well I don't know sign language, but it didn't look like sign language to me. It was a lot of hand gestures. Yeah, no, I understand. And a lot of clacking. But you know, I say that clacking. But you know, it's it's a language because each you know the all the, they were all different. You know what I mean? It's like me sitting here talking to you now. You know, all my words are different. Well, when she was, or, you know, if you're um, a Latino speaking Spanish, you can tell that they're saying different words. Or a Japanese person talking very fast, you can tell that they're saying different words. It was the same thing, and it was very fast. Yeah, no, it's inter- it's very interesting, and I've heard the, the clicking and the popping before. Um, and so do you end up leaving and then coming? I know you went back, what, five or six times? Is that? Yeah, I went back five or six times. And, uh, on my next time I went out there is when she showed me the, she showed me the garden and she shows me her, um, the, you know, she kind of gives me a, a small tour of the property, but not real far. And she told me, and like, were they, I guess their nest or den or whatever you want to call it. She says they stay back there, and we were out. And when we were out there, you know, I did have that feeling of being watched. And she told me she's like they're always there. She's like they always, you know, they're. She's like they always watch me, and you know, they they know her really good. She's like, she's like they're they're always there. There's always one one or two of them is always there. And she would she would never if a burglar went to her house, I would feel so sorry for them. It'd be the worst mistake in the world. And so, and, uh, tell us about ahead. the next time you saw him. Tell, him, tell us about the next time you actually saw the creatures, or if you did see him again, tell um, when he went back out. Okay, um, on the next time I went out, uh, you know, I've seen the juveniles, the babies, a lot. Because there's a big, big, you know, I heard people saying juveniles and all that stuff, but, you know, the, the juveniles are big. The juveniles are bigger than we are. I mean, they're way, you know, like I was telling you, the female that I seen, she was only eight years old, and she was six foot six. And every good of every bit of probably three hundred pounds, but I mean, all mother, I don't think there's an ounce of fat on them. 
the next time, you like I was saying, I, I'd seen the juveniles, and you know, um, I was telling you about this. We were sitting at the kitchen table, and the there was the two juvenile. I guess there was only two babies there at the time that I was there. All I'd seen was two babies, and there's always the same two up there. And they were sitting in the floor, and I was looking at their feet, and I noticed, you know, they they have a padding on their foot, but they also have a uh, oh man, I don't know how to say it. It's, it's like they have a uh, a break in their foot about halfway down. And it's like, um, it almost looks like the, their ankles are in the middle of their foot. And I think as they get older, I'm just, I'm no expert, but I think as they get older, I think maybe they kind of, their feet grow into them or they grow into their feet because they're so big. And it's, it looks like they're, um, like, you know, I was looking at the, the, uh, the eight year old and, you know, I was looking at her and, you know, her ankle placement was farther back like ours were. But the juveniles but, weren't. But the, the juvenile, ju- the, it, it's going to sound weird. The story sounds weird. The story sounds strange. The story sounds unbelievable. But, you know, it looked like their ankle was almost in the middle of their foot. And I don't, that's the only way that I can explain that. That's very interesting. And uh, <laughs> I remember I was out there one time and the lady was telling me, she said that the, I've never really seen them do it, but uh, she said the two babies, she said they fight a lot and they, and they fight over toys a lot. And she did say that they do have a really, really bad temper, but they listened to her. Like when she, she snapped her fingers, they moved and, you know, they kind of, you know, they kind of pouted around like a, a kid would do. And, you know, I never, I guess they was on good behavior with me there, but um, she said that they throw temper tantrums. And she says that, you know, that they have broke stuff in the house. Did she ever tell you what they were? Uh, I think she, I think she refers to them as, as she never said what they were. She, she, always, she referred to them as her neighbors. And I think she, I can't, I, I'm not in the woman's head, but I think she sees them as a people. And I know a lot of people have bad encounters with them. And, you know, I, I would hate to piss, you know, even the eight year old off. Cause I mean, she could probably take on five men and win. And, um, oh, uh, where was I at? I got lost in thought. So you went back, you were going back, uh, to the property. Yeah. yeah going back to the property. Yeah. And the babies. Yes. Yeah, so I was telling you, um, you know, I was telling you about their feet and everything. It was probably like on my fourth time going back out there, you know, I gotten, I hadn't gotten really close with this lady, but you know, she talked to me a lot. She liked drinking coffee and, um, oh, you know, on that second time I was out there, and when she brought the muffins out there, she said they love peanut brittle. And my mother, she she made the, the best peanut brittle in the world. So I took a, a very big thing of peanut brittle out there. And she she said they were very happy with it. It was probably on the fourth. I probably went out there maybe five or six times. And it was either the fourth or fifth time I went out there. I was sitting, and it was later on. It was It had gotten dark on me. And I always told myself I didn't want to be out there at dark because, you know, you know, she, she knows them. I don't. And, you know, I I was, you know, I ain't gonna lie to you. I was a little scared being out there at night and she's sitting there and we're sitting there talking and she just, I can't remember what our conversation was, but she stops and she was like, I'll be back. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, she's like, Papa's here. And this is the first time I've seen the alpha. And she goes outside, and I look out that window, and Wes, it was the, I mean, it was, it was, it was a beast out there. What did you see? I mean, he was so big. I, I swear he was, at his shoulders, he was five foot across. He was humongous. And this lady, she's, she's a, you know, she's a picture of your typical old lady. She's probably five, three, five, four. She was at his waistline, and that that's the God's honest truth. The top of her head was at, at his waistline. And she was out there talking to him. And, you know, I heard a lot of the clacking and everything, and, you know, I'm looking out the window, and he, Papa, I guess I will call him, looks in at me, and, it's like, I look at him, and I get terrified. And I, I didn't want to go out there no more, but he was, I mean, he was he was massive. I thought the uh, the one that yelled at me was big. She had nothing on him. Did he look more human-like, or was he more of... Uh, you know, he had to... It was dark, but it wasn't... You know, there, there's a... Um, 
but I, I guess you know I, I refer to hear them now. The booger lights, what people say, like the lights that you know that they have on the barn, and you know I can make him out pretty good at like his body features, but he was standing with his back to the light. I couldn't make out, you know, actually I could make out his facial features, but I couldn't describe I could really couldn't describe him in detail to you. But he looked he looked like an old man a little bit in his face, is what I think. His nose was really big and his his mouth was ungodly big. I mean he had the biggest that's one thing I remember about him is his mouth was being really, really big. And all of them have really, really like thin lips. Uh, they almost look like they have no lips. And so you see this thing, and, and so what happens next? Um, well, you know, I'm sitting there staring out the window, and she stays out there for like 10 or 15 minutes, and I have no idea what they were talking about, but they were communicating. She comes back in and just picks up our conversation like <laughs> nothing in the world happened. And I'm like, yeah, I was like, I said, that's Papa. I was like, you know, I told her, I was like, he is humongous. She was like, oh, he's a teddy bear. A t- she referred to him as a teddy bear. I mean, I'd hate to run in in a dark in, in a, a lighted alley. I would hate to run into that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he. Yeah, I, I mean, it. his arms. I swear, his arms are big. Were as big as my head, and that that's no lie. And his shoulders and his um the um the, I guess it's the trapezoid muscles that go up to the neck. I mean, they. I mean, just un- unreal. And he, you know, another thing different about him is that I noticed uh, compared to the females and the babies, the females and the babies, they had a, a little bit of a neck. He really didn't have a neck. Like his neck, like when I seen him at, in the light, when I first looked at him, all I seen was those big trapezoid muscles and like a little a little hump on top. And so, you know, his head. And so does he eventually leave? I mean, does he eventually turn and just kind of, I know you said. Oh, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she would sit out there and talk to him and, you know, they done their clacking and you know he takes off walking and she comes back in the house like nothing like nothing had ever happened but you know she's been dealing with them since the 70s oh and she also told me that pretty much all of them that's out there she had not really raised but she looked she looked after pretty much all of them she's been looking after after the baby since the 70s and i say more likely papa was probably one of her you know, one of the babies that was in there at one time. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. And so uh, before you talk about why you never came back, um, did she tell you any more information about them or uh, anything that stands out to you? Um, yeah, she said, uh, she said, I remember her telling me about when they go hunting, she said that they go an an, an unbelievable amount of distance they come back all within the same night she told me that she believes that they were hunting as far as up to the ohio river and that's probably from there as you know in a straight line as the crow flies as everybody says it's probably 40 miles 40 or 50 miles she said she believes that they you know go as far as that and she says she says that they bring that they'll bring her meat she stocks the pond and, you know, she stocks the pond for them. And I asked her, I said, yeah, I remember I asked her, I said, I said, do they have fishing poles? And she's like, no, they get right in the water and catch them. And that's, you know, that that's pretty awesome. Because, yeah, I mean, to catch a fish is really, really, I've tried that as a kid. And she said that they were really good swimmers. And she mentioned something about the star people. Tell me about that. What oh, she- yeah, 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 yeah. That was probably, that was the same night. That was, that was the same night. She told me once the the males get like, I guess to a certain age or something that they have to leave and go with the star people. And I never, ever knew what that meant. I don't know if it's a UFO thing. I don't know. It's, I mean, the story's crazy enough as it is. But going into UFOs even makes it even crazier. <laughs> no, I hear you. But, but, you know, she tells me that once the males get to a certain age that they have to go with the star people for a little while. And she never gave me no... She never, you know, that was pretty much what she told me. She never gave me no details on what it meant or she never explained it to me. Okay, so that was from Sasquatch Chronicles. And to be honest, we're really big fans of this channel. They got a lot of good ones. They're kind of the legends in the game. And it's not just Sasquatch. They have green people, little people, 
all sorts of story, but we kind of have to save time here. So we're gonna move on to a new channel and these are the Cryptid Brothers. They have a lot of good stuff and here's one of our favorite ones that has to do with the cover up. And we're gonna start off our first show of 2018 with a doozy here. I have been on pins and needles waiting to tell you this and I decided to wait on this story until our first episode of uh, January. And um, this is going to be very, very much like the Ohio Bigfoot attack and Fed cover-up. This came to me, um, kind of hot off the press, if you will, from a gentleman I was in contact with way before this story ever broke until he uh, found out about it. And I want to thank him right now. I wish I could give his name. He does not want me to give his name. He was going to tell the story himself. But I'll back up here just a little bit and tell you why. This gentleman um, called me back late last summer and had some interesting things going on in his property. He's in central Florida. He's in a bedroom community about 17 miles from a very, very small town in Florida. And the bedroom community, when I say that, it's really only about four or five neighbors. That's it in his neighborhood. So it is tiny. It is very beautiful where he lives in central Florida, but um, everything is relatively quiet. You know, nothing ever goes on, but over the last year, he's lived there a few years and nothing's ever happened. Nothing strange has occurred, just normal life, if you will, and everybody just um, taking care of their families and working, etc. And um, probably at the summer, he said, Lance, uh, he called in the toll-free number and he said, there's been some strange things going on. I've got things hitting my trailer. I'm finding some weird footprints. I've had pine cones being thrown at the house late at night. He uh, didn't have any um, window coverings on the windows and he decided to cover the windows up one night and then he had a rock thrown through his patio door and it busted the glass. And uh, there's nobody out there. He said, Lance, I don't know what else it could be. He goes, you know, I it could be some kids. He goes, but we're so far out. We're 17 miles out in the country. The likelihood of that happening is very unlikely. He said, I we're getting some weird sounds. He said, um, I put up some um, motion light detectors on the corner and things have settled down. He came out the next day after putting the motion light up on a corner and it was turned up. And so uh, he surmised it. he's got some Bigfoot activity. And he really didn't share so much of that with some of the neighbors, but he kind of got a feel here and there when to talk to them about it. And his neighbor across the street, just about 50, 60 yards across the street from him, she really doesn't believe in that. She ranks Bigfoot up there with the Easter Bunny. And um, her and her husband are retired. And so she says, oh, that's a bunch of hocus pocus. So he didn't share any more. But... um. This gentleman, and I'll just call him my source since he didn't want to give his name, he basically said that uh, uh, he sent me some audio, he sent me pictures, and the audio he sent me was amazing. He sent me some audio that was actually from another neighbor about three quarters of a mile away from where he lives, and uh, it is uh, about seven minutes of howling of a Bigfoot, of wailing. It's incredible. It really is. And um, it was about 15 minutes of this, he said, that was going on. And in the transfer of the information to me, we lost about eight minutes of it, he said. And so he was only able to give me seven minutes of this 15-minute ongoing uh, wailing and howling. It's it's just incredible. And we're actually going to have that sound on the intro of our website every time. But So we stayed in communication. Um, he gave me these sounds, which I uh, really appreciated, and he always would call, see how I'm doing. I would call him to see how he's doing and uh, with what's going on, and he basically had some questions regarding episode 24 of the gentleman, the cousins that were attacked in the cover-up, and you know, I would talk to him about some things and why, and so he was kind of aware of a lot of things, and as he was asking questions and becoming self enthused and listening to the websites and some of these YouTube radio shows. So that's kind of how we became to know each other. And he was going to give this story in the very beginning, but after listening to episode 24 and 
what multiple agencies can do to try and shut you up, he, he got nervous. And he said that I never thought that this would occur right here in my backyard, Lance. I, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. I, I don't care if you narrate it, but I don't, really don't want anyone to recognize my voice. We're only four to five neighbors here in this bedroom community, and I just don't want anybody to recognize and mess with me. I'm retired, and uh, my wife and I, and I, we just want to be left alone and in peace. And I said, I understand. I respect that. So, but I can still tell this story. He said, yes, absolutely. So I tape recorded the conversation so I wouldn't lose any minute detail in this story. So this is what uh, we're going to talk about right now. This occurred in December 10th is when it everything, this story started occurring. So we have a Florida mother that killed a Bigfoot with multiple agency cover-up. And again, this is going to uh, very much reminisce like episode 24, the Ohio Bigfoot attack and cover up, except in this case, a Bigfoot was killed. And I appreciate uh, this gentleman. Again, I'm going to call him my source for going to the links that he did and seeing some of the things that he saw. He, he kind of put himself in a little bit of jeopardy. He did not do it for me. He did it. He's, he's, um, he's a man that's very curious he has a background in the military, and um, he's just passionate about helping people. So thank you very, very much for passing the story on. I've waited with bated breath trying to get this out here to you guys. So here we go. So what happened, this occurred late Sunday night about 11.30 p.m. on December 10th of 2017, this past year. Uh, my source has a neighbor across the street. Again, the disbeliever. And she was out looking for her dog late at night. It wasn't coming in. She normally brings the dog in. So she had a flashlight and she was walking around just the front of her yard and she heard some heavy breathing. She turned and with a light and as she turned, she saw her light shone upon a creature, very large creature, just about 30 to 40 feet away that was standing behind a sign that wasn't too far from her front yard. And this sign was about three foot off the ground and at the height of the sign is about five feet and the width of this sign is about four feet wide. So she saw this thing was actually had a hand underneath the sign and was kind of gripping it and the other hand was kind of on top of the sign. Well, she freaked. She saw this thing and she ran back in the house and she was telling her husband who can't hear very well and so he was just saying, uh, they were arguing, basically, you didn't see the, anything, you saw a bear, she said, the hell I did, I know what I saw, you just need to, um, you know, hear what I'm telling you. So basically, basically, she called my source, her neighbor across the street, and she said, come quickly, come quickly, and bring a gun. So he knew something was up. So he got a gun, he ran across the street, and the neighbor began to tell my source, what she had seen in trying to find her dog. And he said, "Uh uh-huh. She said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I doubted you. I didn't think these things were real. I saw it. I saw it. And he goes, it's okay. It's okay. Just calm down. So she calmed down a little bit and he said, let's go find your dog. So there was a shed out back of her house and they looked in the shed and in the shed, there was a workbench and under the workbench was that dog. He was way back in the corner. So he wouldn't come out, so my source grabbed the collar of this dog and pulled it out. Reluctantly, the dog finally came out. They brought the dog in the neighbor's house, and she was still kind of frantic. The husband was arguing with his wife. You didn't see anything but a damn bear, and she said, I did not. And so they were going back and forth, and so my source was trying to calm both of them down. And finally, after a while, they calmed down. Well... He was going to see himself out the door, and she was walking him out the door about 12.45 a.m. And as they were walking out the door, a sheriff's car sped past with lights on. And then a game warden, Florida game warden car, or an SUV truck, sped past as well with lights on. And they saw that they were down at the end, of, they went down to the end of the street about 150 yards to a neighbor's house that just moved in. We'll call them the new neighbor. They moved in about four months ago. It was a mother, a single mother with three girls. And that these two 
cars with lights on went down. And my source and his neighbor from across the street looked at each other and said, uh, let's go down and see what's going on. So as they were walking out the, her door and opening her gate to go down the street, two more cars went by. Uh, a sheriff SUV car with lights on and a Florida game warden, uh, another truck went by. So now there's four cars down there with lights on. So as they were walking down to the new neighbor's house, my source said, as he approached one of the sheriff's cars, he saw the mother. He recognized the mother, and she was in the back seat, and she was handcuffed. And he's thinking to himself, what the hell's going on? So he walked up. He saw a game warden on the porch talking to the girls, or a one of the middle girls. And so he approached the game warden and with his neighbor, and he said, uh, uh, excuse me, sir, what, what, what's going on here? He goes, uh, and the game warden said, who are you? He said, uh, well, I'm, we're the neighbors down the street, and uh, nothing ever goes on like this around here. So what, what's going on, if I may ask? He said, well, this mother uh, discharged, a firearm, uh, discharged a firearm unlawfully and shot a bear. And he said, really? About that time, that middle-aged girl that was in grade school said, no, mommy, mommy shot a monster. Mommy shot a monster. And the game warden looked down at her and he said, you need to go inside the house with your sisters. So my source and his neighbor from across the street both looked at each other, kind of, uh-huh, mm-hmm. So the game warden said, there's nothing to see here, sir. Just You need to just go back home. So they turned away, walked back to their homes. And my source uh, saw his neighbor off at her house and he walked back across the street to his after about 10 minutes or so, he waited and he, the, the four of the cars, the two game warden trucks and the two sheriff SUV cars drove past and there was nobody there at the new neighbor's place, but he knew that the girls were still there. So he walked back down the street, knocked on the door and uh, basically said, uh, girls, I'm sure you're shook up. Uh, do you just want to come stay with me and my wife? Well, you stay the night and uh, we'll feed you breakfast in the morning and then you can leave. So the girls said, yes, yes, we want to go, yes. So he got the girls, and um, they all went back down to, to um, his house where his wife um, and him live, and uh, they basically uh, stayed the night there. So then, as they got into his house, as he was kind of feeding the girls, as they were bedding down, and uh, the one of the girls said, Mommy, Mommy didn't shoot a bear. She shot a monster. It was a monster. My source was just kind of, huh, I wonder if um, it was a Bigfoot, is what he was kind of asking himself. He still didn't know the specifics of what was going on. And so um, so once the girls were settling down and um, they were getting ready to um, go to bed, he decided to, my source decided to sneak out his back door of his house, kind of in the dark, and he walked around to the back side of the property of the new neighbor's house. Again, it was about 150 yards. He walked in the woods, walked down, and came from and approached the back side of the property to about 40 feet from her trailer. And what he did is he squatted down in the tree line, which was only about 10, probably, actually he said about 15 feet. 20 feet into the tree line, which is still about 40 feet from her trailer. So if you can imagine what he was telling me, there's about 15 feet to uh, 20 feet of trees, and then it is a mowed area. It's clear, and then it's her trailer. So as he squatted down in the wood line there, he was trying to get a good position, but where no one could see him, he thought, I'm just going to sit right here if someone, just see what goes on. And, he's, and it was, he couldn't see much because it was dark, but he could see that she had a nightlight out in front of her house, but it cast a shadow to the back of uh, her trailer. So he was squatted down, he got behind a tree, and he just kind of stuck his head out, and he was just kind of watching and waiting. And within a few minutes, a few minutes of just squatting down, he said, here comes a, um, a game warden truck. He could tell, and I asked him, how, do, how can you tell? And he said it had the emblem right on the door. Florida Game uh, Wildlife Department, and it had their emblem right there. He said it was a quad cab, and it had a, like a short bed. 
in it. Um, a truck is what it was. And it backed in. And then there was two other trucks that came that just pulled in with their with their lights. And then they shut their lights off. Mm-hmm. And the quad cab, uh, all three of the trucks were Florida um, wildlife game trucks. And the quad cab that backed in was shining lights. You know, it had its reverse lights. And he says, when it had those lights, I could see clearly then that there was a body laying on that cleared area, that mowed area back behind um, her uh, her house right there. And it was, uh, you could see that the feet were sticking up. And he said, you could clearly see the, the arms. And it was sprawled out right on the ground. He said, uh, I asked him, I said, what, could you tell size? He said, you can just tell it was big. He said, at least from the ground to the chest area that I could gauge, it was at least two and a half to three foot thick, at least. He said it pulled in, that truck pulled in with probably about 10 feet from that Bigfoot, and it stopped. They turned off the trucks, and out of the quad cab, three game wardens got out. And I asked him, I said, how do you know it was a game warden? He says, well, they were all wearing the same uniform. There was the quad cab that backed up, had three guys get out. They all had the same uniform, and they had the game warden badge. And then out of the other two game warden trucks was a single game warden that got out of those trucks. So there was a total of five of them. And they all were wearing the uniform and had the guns on the side and everything. He said they had flashlights, and they were they had flashlights down on the Bigfoot, and they were looking at it. He said they were saying something, but I couldn't quite hear what they were saying because everything was kind of like a, 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 almost like a whisper. You could hear them talking, but I couldn't discern what they were saying. And so one of the, one of the game wardens um, opened the tailgate to the quad cab truck and um, he had one of those roll away. He said, Lance, it's one of those roll away. It's it's like a, um, it locks and it, it goes in tracks. It, it can, you know, so you don't have your stuff stolen out of the back of the um, uh, truck bed. And it's on a track. And it basically locks your stuff up that's in the back of your um, bed of your truck. I said, oh, I think I know. And he said, it, they pushed it open. He slid it open. And then I got back down. And then they started to lift this Bigfoot. And I said, did they have a net? Did, what, what, did, what did it look like? He said, well, he said, they just were manhandling it. He said they had an arm, they had the legs, and one guy had like the head. And he said, you can tell they were struggling. When they tried to lift it up, it was, they were struggling. They almost dropped it. And they were, you could tell they were straining. And then finally, what they did is they loaded it head first on its back. And then they pushed it up in the truck bed. And uh, one guy was up in the truck bed and the, they grabbed onto the arms and they pulled it up as the others were on the ground pushing kind of the legs and feet. And they finally got it loaded and they pushed the feet in and kind of bent a little bit uh, at the knee and they shut the truck bed. And then they, the two guys were in, got out and then they took the uh, truck liner that's in that, the, that lock away liner, they rolled it. And then they locked it. So you couldn't see anything from the top. It's just locked in. And everybody got in their respective trucks and they left. And I said, he said they were there and they were, got their business done. They were in and out within less than 15 minutes. So he couldn't believe what he was seeing. He just couldn't believe it. And so he got up, my source got up, he walked back through the woods and came in the back side of his property and got went back into his home. And that was it at that point in time. The girls were sleeping. Everybody was asleep at his house. And so at that point in time, he went to bed. The next morning, well, earlier that day, so it's already, that was Sunday, early, early. Uh, Sunday's when this started. And that was already, when he was watching these game wardens, that was already early, early in the morning uh, of Monday, uh, December 11th. So what he did, he got up. The girls got up relatively early uh, that morning. uh, Two of the girls had to go to school. School was still in session. And so he fed them, and the girls walked over to their place to get ready for school. And the oldest was helping the sisters. And um, so they left back to their house. And within about seven to ten minutes, my source said he gets a knock at his door. 
And this was about 9 a.m. again on Monday, December 11th. He gets a knock on the door about 9. He answers and there was two guys standing at the doorstep. And one guy was in a black suit, clean cut. And the other guy was kind of dressed casual with a light scruffy beard. A little bit larger than the clean cut guy in the suit. And uh, he noticed they had pulled up in a black car. And they really didn't introduce themselves at all. They just said, good morning. Uh, we heard that you and your neighbors were down the street last night at the neighbor's house. He said, yeah, we were down there because nothing like this ever happens around here. And we wanted to know what was going on. And uh, it's typically dead around here. So we were just curious what was happening. So this, uh, we'll call this guy, the men in black guy, because he was kind of in a black car and he was in a black suit. He said, uh, do you know what happened? And my source said, well, all I know is that a woman discharged a gun and supposedly shot a bear. And the uh, men in black guy said, he said, yes, that's what we were told too. And he said, do you, have you heard of anything else that was said? And my source thought, this is interesting, but he did, you know, he was just thinking this. He said, no, nothing else that I'm aware of. And, um, he said, well, if we want to get in touch with you, how do we contact you, sir? And my source said, well, I'll be right here. I ain't going nowhere. I've been here a long time. So that was all that was said. And they got back into their car. And as they were pulling away, my source said he noticed that it had government tags. And then they just left. And they didn't go to anyone's home. They were just at his home that they noticed. And they left down the street. So later that day, my source said that he had to go to the store to get some groceries for him and his wife. And he was stopped while he was going to the grocery store. He was pulled over by a local deputy sheriff while driving into town. And he always drives the speed limit, he said. He goes, I never break the speed limit law. He goes, what? He goes, I'm driving the speed limit way under. It's like, you know, 35 miles an hour. I'm doing 30. And then uh, he gets pulled over. And he knew he hadn't been speeding. And so when he got pulled over, the deputy came up to the window and he said, uh, uh, why did you pull me over? I wasn't speeding. And the deputy said, yes, you're right, but I pulled you over because you have a back light out. And so my source got and walked around the back of his car and he said, where? I don't have any lights out. He's thinking tail lights. He said, both of my tail lights work. He said, no. The deputy said, right there, you have a light out uh, over your license plate. Well, there was two little bulbs that light up the license plate. One was on and one was out. And my source said, that's a tiny light bulb. One is still on. I still have one that's still uh, lit. And the deputy said, you'll still have to get that fixed, sir. So my source got back into the car and kind of held his tongue. He said, thank you, sir. Have a nice day. I appreciate it. I'll get it fixed. And he went on to the grocery store. And he's thinking to himself, what the hell? Why would... There's something that's not driving here. And so... He got his grocery shopping done, and he put the groceries in, and he, as he was driving away from the grocery store, he noticed immediately that he was being followed by a sheriff's car in an SUV. And the sheriff tailgated, literally tailgated him all through town and all the way back to his home 17 miles away. He said, Lance, he was so close. He was like six feet at some times from my back bumper. If I would have barely touched my brake, he would have rammed me. He said, after a while, it was starting to really piss me off. He said, I thought, honestly, he was going to hit me a few times. I almost stopped and just said, what the hell are you doing? He goes, but I held my tongue. I didn't say anything. I didn't give any hand gestures. I just kind of looked straight ahead as if he was not back there the whole time. But obviously, this at this point now being pulled over, now I'm being tailgated by a sheriff. This has got to be some type of intimidation tactic or something. I don't know what they're up to. They must think I know something that I'm not supposed to. I don't know, but this is absurd. So they must think I know something. So they tailgated, this deputy sheriff tailgated me, he said, all the way to my house. I pulled into my drive and then he just kept going straight. He never stopped. He just kept going straight and kept going on. 
Never said anything, just kept going straight. And I, I thought, they must think I know something about this Bigfoot killing. They, know, they don't know what I know, but they're just trying to see. And if I'll crack or break, I don't know. This is bizarre. So this sheriff's car went straight on, never pulled away. So that was Monday, December 11th. Now, Tuesday, December 12th. And again, my source was just telling me day by day what was going on. He had called me and said, Lance, you got it. This is what happened yesterday. Lance, this is what happened again later today. So I was documenting all this as he was calling me. So this is Tuesday, December 12th, 2017. He said, it's morning time. It's about 930. And my source had a knock at the door. And he opened the door and there were two guys, different guys, um, than the day before that knocked on his door that had government tags. And these two guys were driving a black Lincoln like car, like some type of Crown Victoria or Lincoln. And it too had government tags. Now these guys were different. They were both uh, pretty clean cut, about the same height, uh, average height. They were not in suits. They were just kind of casually dressed, and they basically asked my source what the first two guys had asked the day before. And my source said, well, as far as I'm aware of, the neighbor lady down the street discharged a gun and shot a bear illegally. And one of the guys said, well, are you sure that's all you heard? And my source said, yes, that's what I told the other two guys that I spoke to yesterday that was here. So they left. These two guys got back into their car, turned around. And again, he noticed that they had government tags as well and drove off. And they were only there for about five minutes or so, he said. They didn't drive to any other neighbor homes that he could tell. Um, they may have, but they didn't drive anywhere else after they left his driveway. They went on. And he told me, I, when I asked him, I said, what do you think they're there? And he says, well, I think they were there visiting me twice because they knew that the girls stayed the night with him and his wife. And they were trying to see how much information that the girls divulged to him about what had occurred about their mother shooting a Bigfoot. I'm sure that's what it was. And I concurred after, you know, discussing this with him. So he said later that day in the afternoon, my source got a call from a neighbor, a buddy of his, and we'll call his neighbor, neighbor one. He owns, uh, neighbor one owns quite a bit of property in that area, and uh, he couldn't find one of his dogs and was wanting to know if my source would go with him and help him. And my source said, of course, yeah, uh, give me a second. Let me get things tied up here and I'll help you. And also this a neighbor um, guy contacted another neighbor and we'll call him neighbor number two, who also owns property that abuts up against neighbor one's property. Neighbor one has quite a bit, like 120 acres. Neighbor two has about like 30 acres, but they abut up against each other's property. So neighbor one said, hey, when I come with us, I'm going to look for my dog. Neighbor two said, yeah, I'll go well. I'll go, I'll go with you guys. So my source also knew neighbor one didn't have a gun, so he brought a gun for him, and he had a gun. So, you know, he says, anytime you go anywhere, everybody needs to carry a gun. So he said, we went. So all three of these neighbors, which included my source, set out to walk on neighbor one's property looking for neighbor one's dog. And they, and, and all this property was behind neighbor one's um, house. The entrance to the property actually is very close to neighbor one's house. And he has about 120 acres, like I said. And that's the gate to get in and get out. My source said no sooner had they began, had begun to walk onto neighbor, the neighbor's woods, only about 50 to 60 yards in the woods as they were walking, and they heard something at first and then they turned and they saw all three of them saw military soldiers with firearms walking slowly in neighbors one neighbor one's woods and my source said that there was about 10 soldiers they were in fatigues and they had their helmets on and they were all carrying ar-15s and i said how do you know they weigh ar-15s he said well I'm, i've been in the military i have military experience i i know what things are he said that neighbor one uh, approached one of the soldiers who was kind of a breaking away from the group to approach him. And neighbor one said, uh, what are you guys doing on my property? Because neighbor one has his property posted everywhere. No hunting, no fishing. 
because all of the livestock he has around his property, you know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want anyone to come in there and uh, mess with his livestock or his land. And the soldier came forward was a sergeant. And he said, uh, and he could tell from the patch, it was a sergeant. And he said, we're conducting a military exercise, sir. And neighbor was, and neighbor one said, not on my property. No one gave anybody authority to do that. And the sergeant said, we can go anywhere we want, sir. And neighbor one said, who's in charge here? So the sergeant said, my lieutenant, who was up a little ways and came walking forward to neighbor one. He can see that he was talking to the sergeant. And he stepped up. And this uh, lieutenant was a young guy, my source said. He was probably about somewhere around 24, 25 in age. And uh, he basically said he was a kind of a cocky ass, is what he said. And he spoke to my neighbor and said, he looked at neighbor one and he said, you either get off the property now or we'll have to remove, remove you from the property immediately. Then neighbor one said, who is your commander? And the lieutenant didn't say a word. He said, we will remove you if you do not leave now, sir. Now, what was very interesting, my source said, is that while they were talking to this military personnel standing there about 50 or 60 feet into neighbor one's wood line, some of the military, uh, there was a military-like helicopter flying overhead and through neighbor one's woods. He states that it was like a two-seater type of small helo that was all black with the open doors and that there were no numbers or letters, no identification on the side of this helicopter, but it had a large black dome under the belly of the helo. And my source said it reminded him back when he was uh, in the military like a heat-seeking or thermal detection device. It's like a big bulb mounted on the bottom. And it, too, was kind of like a tinted black. He said, I'm sure of it. I'm sure that it was some type of a thermal device, heat-seeking device. With my military experience, that's what we used to have, too. And he said they were flying all over the property when they were talking to this um, sergeant and lieutenant. So they agreed that the military was in uh, some type of operation of locating, eliminating, and extracting any remaining Bigfoots in the area on neighbor one's property. And that my source said to neighbor one, he said, we just, let's just go. Let's, let's just go. Just, just, I'll, I'll tell you about what's going on. So they left, walking back to neighbor one's home. And neighbor one said, I don't know how the hell they got onto my property when the main entrance is right by my house. And my source said, I guarantee you that they're coming in somewhere on the back side of the property through that abandoned state park area. Behind neighbor one and behind partly of neighbor two's property is an abandoned state park that's been fenced in and gated in. It's absolutely off to the public. There's nobody going in. It's been closed off to the public for a long time, my source says. He said, I bet you they're coming through your property through that abandoned state park, through the back way or something. So when they got up back to neighbor one's house, my, or, my source asked neighbor two if he could walk to the back of his property to take a closer look and see if he could see anything fishy, what was going on. And neighbor two, neighbor two said, sure. So my source took off slowly, walking carefully, staying out of the line of sight, walking near a high dirt embankment, which was about, he said, about 18 feet in height, while being concealed in the swamp weeds. He said that he walked all the way to the far east end of neighbor two's property, as far away as to not be seen by anyone if there was anyone back there. On top of this eight-foot embankment, he said that there was a wooden fence with about four-by-four four post and one-by-sixes across the top, and it was white. As soon as he reached the back end of neighbor two's property, he waited for about, he said, 20 to 30 minutes by laying down in the weeds and just kind of waiting. And no sooner than about that 20 to 30 minutes, and there was two vehicles that pulled through a fenced gate from the abandoned state park, which adjoined neighbor one's property. One vehicle was black Econo van, he said, with, with not many windows, but it did have some, some small windows in the back that were tinted. But the window where the driver and passenger was at was not tinted. 
and the other vehicle that followed was a black SUV with dark tinted windows all the way around. So my source knew, he said, he goes, this is where they're coming in to neighbor one's property right here. I knew it. Then he went back to call neighbor one and uh, where they had come in at. And as he was speaking to neighbor one over the land phone, they both agreed to hang up and talk over their cell phones instead. So my source said they discussed that if anybody could be listening on their landlines, it would be more challenging and they thought difficult to do cell phones. So they hung up and they called back and spoke on their cell phones to discuss the matter, what was going on on the back of uh, neighbor one's property. And so that ended Tuesday, December 12th events. So Wednesday, December 13th, 2017, my source gets a call from neighbor two and said that late last night that it sounded like a war zone at the back of his property. My source said that he didn't hear anything, probably because he can't hear much when the doors and the windows are shut. And he also asked neighbor one if he had heard anything, and he said no. But he thought that very, very strange that he heard all these guns going off late at night. Pow, 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 pow. And so later, my source said that later that morning, he saw the oldest daughter walking down the road, taking her little sisters to the bus stop. And my source asked uh, the daughter, he decided to uh, go down there. He said, how's everything going, hon? And the girl said, I don't want to talk about it. My mother said that I'm not supposed to talk about what happened. My source said, okay, okay, no problem, no problem. I understand, but how's your mother doing? And the daughter said, oh, uh, she's doing okay. She's home sleeping right now. I asked him who he thought may have spoken to the girls and why they seemed a little anxious because they, they appeared that way when my source was telling me. And he said, well, I'm sure the mother's mother definitely talked to them, but who talked to her? Most likely the guys in black, he said. My source said that the oldest daughter was trying to get her mom out of jail and needed some assistance later that day. So my source helped the oldest daughter in getting the mother released to go back home which did happen later that day, about three to four hours later. He said that the oldest daughter did say, though, that they were outside of that night, which would have been Sunday night. They were out playing. All three were out playing till about 11 p.m. And then they went back inside. Shortly after, their mother pulled up, and that's when they heard shots from their mother's pistol. They went outside and saw what she had shot. So this is when the oldest daughter went back in the house immediately and called the sheriff's department to tell tell what their mother had shot. Of course, the girls and the mother did not expect that the mother would be arrested and jailed from this incident. So when my source and I spoke about this, this is where basically people need to be aware of. The first people that you call is not a sheriff, is not a game warden. And we'll get into who you need to call later here. So let's continue on. I asked how much of a bond that the court set to my source of this mother being jailed. And he said it was a ridiculous amount. It's more than it should have been, Lance. Again, most likely a potential tactic in trying to show how serious they are. They being the men in black, I guess, or this agency, this Fed agency, on wanting things kept quiet and what they can do. I told my source I told my source that they most likely took her pistol and they may have even confiscated her phone which she won't get back I'm sure and we both agreed and I asked my source has he seen the mother out and about being that she's out of jail and he said yes I've seen her she's um she you know she leaves and then she comes back from work but hasn't spoken to her she just goes to work and comes home goes to work and comes home Also, later that same day, my source had gone into town later, and so he decided to, uh, before he was going to drive into town, he decided to drive down by the new neighbor, the lady, the mother that shot the Bigfoot, to go, there's a loop down there, so he decided to go past her house and loop around, then go back as uh, he was going into town, just to see anything going on at her place, or, you know, just to kind of see what's going on. And so as he drove down the street to the new neighbor's house, 
as he was driving past the house, just before he uh, did a U-turn, as he drove past, he noticed that in the back of her trailer, there was a black SUV with government plates right there because they were pulled in and he could easily see the plates and that there was two men in the near the back door of her place. One of the guys had a rake and uh, where the dead Bigfoot was found dead and where he was not too far away in the woods. We both believe that they were there picking up any remaining evidence of dried blood, collecting any tissue specimens from the shooting, and erasing any evidence or tracks, basically wiping the area clean of any evidence of what transpired during the early hours of that previous Monday. So it was kind of crazy when he told me. I just couldn't believe it, but I could believe it. So they were basically wiping the area clean, checking for any uh, blood smears on the trailer, any evidence, collecting everything, so as if nothing ever occurred. So Thursday came, December 14th. My source contacted me and he said, um, Lance, there's nothing going on today. Everything seems to be just like it was prior to everything just uh, uh, going crazy on Sunday. He said everything is quiet. There's no black SUVs. There's no one knocking on doors. There's no military. There's nothing. There's no helicopters. It's just quiet now. So we spent hours and hours talking about this and reviewing what happened and why. So in listening to this, I basically said, you know, this is exactly what happened during the Ohio Bigfoot. He said, yeah, I can't believe this, Lance. He said, I never thought in a million years it would occur something like that here. And I said, well, you never know where and you never know when. I said, but the problem that people have is when they contact people of authority thinking they're going to help them. And what happens is they end up being crucified. They end up being sent to jail, ridiculed, embarrassed, threatened, and they did nothing wrong. They thought they were doing something right by contacting the quote unquote appropriate officials. So after all this, and in speaking to my source, and we still talk on a weekly basis, I thought about this and said, what can anyone learn from this Bigfoot shooting? This obvious local law enforcement, wildlife department, federal department, and military cover-up involving four different agencies. This is crazy. There's people that know out there, but they want to cover things up. Why? Well, I think it's quite simple. I think that they want to cover it up because they're afraid it would cause mass panic, and I can see that. I think they want to cover it up because you can have loss of dollars. I think that's the primary loss of revenue. Again, we spoke about this on episode 24, and I've heard this said on Sasquatch Chronicles and Bigfoot Outlaws and uh, Brenton Sawin show that can you imagine the billions of dollars that would be lost from people not camping hunting, hiking, boating, fishing, on and on and on, if there was a relic hominoid creature among the woods and how people would not go and then you'd have people go with pitchforks. I mean, there would be such a variety of people that would stay away from the woods and those that would go into the woods. You would have people from PETA wanting to say everything is protected then across the United States. Nothing, you can't hunt anywhere if these things are out there. So it would cause a mass chaotic Pandora's box, if you will, of lost revenue, of so many federal laws, wildlife laws. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on of potential. Um, There's a really good book out there that I just started. It's been out there for a long time. My brother Bill started getting me on it, and it goes through some scenarios out there. It's called Enoch by Autumn Williams. Very good book. I would read that because in the very beginning, she goes through a potential scenario that I think it could be quite true on what could happen on something like that. So I want to say here in closing just a little bit is first, if you ever shoot down or kill a Bigfoot or a Dogman or become injured from a Bigfoot or Dogman attack, what should you do? Well, first of all, you shouldn't call any law enforcement authorities. Not unless you have a dire emergency, health related, uh, your life is in jeopardy or others that are seriously injured. Honestly, if if uh, 
So what does that constitute? Well, that's going to be on a person-to-person basis here. But if uh, your life's not in jeopardy, and you've, um, and this is just my opinion, if you were pushed or you have a laceration and you're going to make it, then you really shouldn't or I wouldn't call the authorities. Why? Because the people who you think, again, that are going to help you, that are going to be the very ones who, as I said before, crucify you in sending you to jail. They will intimidate you. They will coerce you and tell you to keep your trap shut, plain and simple. So unfortunately, if these good folks who have the first time encounter and have never listened to any shows like ours and others, they're going to call the local law enforcement or they're going to call the county game warden. Either one is not a smart idea. It's just not. Okay, so that's going to be it for now. To be honest, it was kind of hard to pick our three favorite because there are a lot of good ones. And like I said, we will go into a more historical and occult analysis of each cryptid as we continue this series. But in order to get the full context, I wanted to help those who may not know about this genre of storytelling or phone interviews so that they can go explore and support these channels. It serves as a good introduction as we begin to go down the journey of lore and myth behind these beings. It begins to all add together to form a solid picture of what might be happening. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please go support these channels if you like the video and all we can hope is that our minds will be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?